Um, yeah, so this is a pretty exciting event for uh, for us at the region of Waterloo. Um, you know, as everybody has been uh, uh, experiencing, the, the 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 pandemic of COVID nineteen has uh, changed fundamentally the way that we are currently living and working uh, uh, in the water in the region of Waterloo. Um, it uh, it may be a temporary um, uh, a change in the way we our our region is functioning. But, it, but there may be permanent implications. And so um, uh, the pandemic has coincided with another important exercise that we're involved in, the review of our regional official plan. This, uh, this policy document uh, shapes the, the long run uh, future of the Waterloo region. Um, it's a document which um, establishes our, uh, our, our land use um, uh, strategy. It uh, helps shape infra infrastructure decisions. It indicate, you know, it uh, directs how we will uh, preserve the natural uh, heritage and, and agricultural resources of our region. And um, uh, in particular, uh, it um, helps us all make decisions about where we invest and uh, and how we how we do so in order to build a more sustainable and livable region. And um, in the middle of all of that. Uh, con with consultations, uh, engagement of the public in <clears throat> already well underway. And COVID-19 came along and uh, changed fundamentally the way that we uh, operate in the region. So um, uh, we were, um, uh, Gene, Andre, and, and I had a, had a conversation about, um, you know, whether or not uh, it may be possible to harness some of the resources of the, uh, of the University of Waterloo to try and understand what the implications for the region might be. Um, and um, I'm really delighted with uh, the outcome of that conversation. Um, we, um, she was able to rally uh, uh, 13 uh, research teams around, uh, around the topics that you have uh, before you today and uh, very quickly generate a series of white papers that, uh, that um, explore some of these implications. Of course, the pandemic is continuing to evolve and uh, the way that the region responds to it is continuing to evolve. But um, you know, we felt uh, because we were working on a timeline with the regional official plan, you know, it was incumbent upon us to uh, pull in the best information uh, from uh, an external perspective that we, that we can in order to understand the long run implications. So I'm very excited about this. Uh, uh, it's gonna be a thought provoking afternoon and I really appreciate the University of Waterloo uh, rallying around this uh, important um, uh, topic for, for us here in the region and for those of us that are uh, participating from outside the region as well. All right, thank you very much, Rod. Um, now over to you, Jean. Okay, well, thank you. So. Um... On behalf of the University of Waterloo, I do wanna thank the region for partnering with, with us in exploring the implications of COVID-19 for this community that we live in and we share in, and in particular for being able to help shape the official plan. As Rod said, he, um, um, he and I had a first conversation as COVID was still a relatively new phenomenon. It was in April, we spoke about the idea for this initiative and um, after that conversation, I reached out to a few of my colleagues in the School of Planning and um, they in turn suggested others. And I sent out an email to a number of people from four different faculties asking about their interest in participating. And I said, you have a chance to have an impact. Um, there's a little bit of resources available for hiring a student and you have a tight timeline, are you in? And everyone said they were in um, very quickly. It was a bit like those wedding dances, you know, where a few people start dancing and then each person goes and gets another. That was a bit how it happened. And, I mentioned this because this kind of engagement on important questions, I think speaks to the role of universities and to the changing roles. So I just wanna share a moment or two of thought about the roles of universities. And I'm gonna crib from an address that was given by one of the world's most famous sociologists, Manuel Castells. So uh, Manuel Castells is a, is a Spanish uh, professor, although he's at uh, University of Southern California. But as of uh, January, I think of this year, he was asked to become the minister of universities in his home country of Spain and in shaping the, universe, the Spanish universities, 50 of them for the future. And he's written about what the role of universities are. And I just wanna 
say a few of these as a way of framing the things that our colleagues are going to talk about today. So he says there's sort of six roles. The first one is university started out as a producer of values, and he makes reference to the linkages between the early universities and, and the religions, whether you're talking about the first universities in Italy or Morocco, I think you know people debate where the first university was. The second, he says, is that there was um, the role of the university was to establish a social stratification, an elite of type. And in fact, still today, he notes that many of the leaders of our world, both business and um, in the political world, have graduated from just a very small number of universities. This is, this is the creation of the elite, if you like. He talks about a third function, is, which is the training of the labor force, looking in particular at um, professions like medicine and engineering, um, computer science, law. And then he talks about how in the late 1800s and early 1900s, something else began to happen, that universities began, began to take on that role of discovery. And so here we get the universities that, that, that are research intensive or um, science focused. And then the fifth role he talks about is about educating the masses. And, and then he talks about a sixth, which I'll just mention in a moment. But in, in the first five, you'll recognize that in the public Canadian institutions that you, you know and you love perhaps, some of those functions remain and others have more or less um, faded away. Now, the sixth role, he says, which I think links to today, is that he talks about the entrepreneurial university. And if that's the university that connects with the work, connects the world of science and technology with business and with policy. And he talks about uh, Stanford and MIT as examples. But certainly, for those of you who are on the call from the University of Waterloo, you'll also recognize the kind of um, way we've come to think about ourselves, at least to some extent. And I think it's in this, this last phase, which is, which is most exciting, because what it really says is that the university must be relevant in looking at the questions that matter for society. I think how we plan our communities matters. And so I'm really happy to have our, our people here sharing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jean. In terms of the structure for our symposium today, um, basically what, as I mentioned, we're going to have a series of presentations under each of the four theme areas. Uh, there's a variety of presenters, as you can see from the agenda. And what I really want to stress to our audience, and there's uh, some over 150 people uh, participating today, is that we really value your questions today. Both the region values these questions and uh, the session is being recorded. So. Um, it, it's really important to get your perspective and your thoughts on, on what you're hearing in terms of the impacts of COVID-19 in the region and, and moving forward. But also the researchers really appreciate uh, having different perspectives on their work as they present it. Um, they're hungry for that kind of feedback uh, as it'll help them refine the, the final products that they're going to produce uh, for the region. So I really would encourage the audience to use the, um, the question and answer uh, function within Zoom. Um, and I'll be monitoring that as I uh, go through the presentations. And then when we have the Q&A period, I'll basically be engaging those questions um, with each of the presenters and their teams of researchers. Uh, so that's how we're going to roll through things today. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to remember where I, I focused my eyeballs. I didn't focus them in the right location to see what how we're doing for timing. Um, the timing, I know, again, there might be people uh, joining the call partway through or leaving if you've got to take a break and come back. Uh, we're going to do our absolute best uh, to try and stay on the time schedule within uh, that we've organized. Uh, and I think you can maybe appreciate that uh, we'll, we'll probably uh, be able to use up time and get back on track uh, if people go a little bit longer in some of their presentations. Not that academics are known to get long-winded, uh, but that may happen on occasion. Um, so without further ado, uh, and hopefully I didn't forget anything in terms of the usual uh, organizational uh, beginning comments, um, but it's going to be an interesting experience this afternoon. I really encourage you to, again, um, engage as best you can through the Q&A, uh, and we'll get things rolling without further ado. So I'm going to uh, invite... Actually Sorry, oh. if I can just interrupt very quickly, I apologize. I just wanted, nope. we never mentioned uh, that we are recording this session. 
Uh, so for, for those that are on the call, just please be aware that we are recording the session and it will be available on the YouTube channel for uh, the region of Waterloo following the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I uh, forgot to mention that as well. Um, okay, so without further ado, then let's get into our first uh, subject area, which deals with the economy and work. Um, all of us have been impacted, obviously, uh, economically and, and through our work, I'm sure. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, ask our first presenter, uh, Tara Vinadre, to, uh, to lead us off. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Clarence. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to present today um, a, a, a piece of research that really represents a team effort between myself, Marcus Moses, the Director of Planning at the University of Waterloo, and our fantastic team of Waterloo planning students, uh, and especially David Adama, uh, who conducted a really substantial amount of the background research and data collection that uh, goes into what you'll see today. Um, and this work is part of a broader project that uh, Marcus Mose and I have been working on over the last several years, uh, where we've been very concerned with the intersection of housing and economic development and its impact on what we, what we call new economy cities. And we think that's of particular relevance to a place like the region of Waterloo, uh, which has had a very strong presence uh, in tech, uh, which has been you know, one of the places where we're seeing a lot of change and shift in, in, this, immediate, in this sort of immediate part of the pandemic. Uh, and has been really a, a key driver of the regional economy. Um, and so over the past few months, and if I can have the next slide, please, uh, over the next few months, after, after, over the last few months, we've really been paying attention to uh, the larger debate about the future of cities and what it means when firms make different decisions about how they structure work and how they structure their innovation processes and where they're going to locate those activities. Um, and so this is a bigger debate about the future of cities. And we want to sort of remind our audience that there's a lot more nuance to this than what you might see in the news. And I sort of put up here sort of the, the two different announcements, competing announcements by the one very big and, and central uh, company, Facebook, which on the one hand announced that they were going to shift a larger portion of their work to remote locations, which we done remotely, but at the same time is doubling down on investment in cities as places of work, as places to have offices. Um, and this is sort of seen across the tech sector. And we have to ask questions about whether the tech is the canary in the coal mine uh, for what might happen in a post-pandemic post future. And what we want to emphasize is that this is a much more complex question and it's not going to be all one or all the other. And we want to kind of dig into some of that. And we think it's especially relevant in mid-sized communities or regions like the region of Waterloo uh, that may not be as large as New York and London, which are benefiting from places like Facebook, uh, companies like Facebook and Google announcing that they will continue to expand offices in those locations. Um, they're much smaller. And so the question is, you know, what happens in these mid-sized um, dynamic regions, much like the one that what most of us are living and working in at the moment. Um, so this is where we're at. So the next, the next slide actually sort of grounds this bigger debate in this very region itself. And uh, very early on in the pandemic, Shopify was one of the first Canadian companies, one of the first tech companies to announce that it was gonna you know, shift remote work until at least 2021, and was in fact thinking about doing this on a much more permanent basis. And of course this raises questions, particularly for a place like, like Waterloo, which has just seen an expansion of this very company in the region and into, and into downtown office spaces. So it really raises questions about what this might mean uh, for this region. But we want to contrast that story with another tech story in the region, a tech startup story of Inksmith, which was an ed tech company uh, that's been now very well storied in the Canadian media um, around their pivot from uh, doing you know, 3D printing and making for educational technologies and very quickly and in a very short amount of time uh, shifted into uh, the production of PPE uh, and did so uh, in a way that has generated a large number of mid-skill jobs and has generated employment uh, and that employment can't be done remotely because it's manufacturing work. And this, of course, reflects the sort of two stories of this region. One, uh, where we see a sort of very strong industrial past that's now coming to bear on the post-pandemic urban future of this region. And if I can have my next slide, please. Uh, so this summer, we sort of set out to sort of really understand this puzzle around what's going to happen to the, you know, the dynamics of an urban economy like the region of Waterloo. And so what we want to do is sort of take these broader trends and ground them in the experience of this region and sort of think through what this might mean longer term for a place like, like, uh, like the Kitchener Waterloo region. So we looked at the academic literature, we looked at sort of a lot of the industry and policy reports coming out. We thought it important to ground some of that in an empirical understanding of the region. And we sort of took a, a post a pre, sorry, pre pandemic snapshot, uh, looking at, you know, what's the industrial structure of this region, what's growing, what's shrinking, um, 
what's happening right now or pre-pandemic in terms of where people were already working, were they working from home, uh, and what kinds of commuting patterns were, were uh, effect, uh, sorry, excuse me, related to those sectors. Because I think, again, it's about this nuance, it's sort of a large region, there's a lot of different kinds of economic activity, and we have to consider that whole bucket, even as we watch one of the key sectors really shifting in a particular direction. And so in our work, uh, because it's part of a larger shirk funded project, we're very interested in both sort of this tech piece and, uh, and traditional manufacturing. And this, of course, aligns well with a strong history in this region of economic development strategies that have, in fact, emphasized the importance of these sectors for uh, the economic competitiveness and growth of the region. And can I have my next slide, please? Uh, so looking at the literature, we sort of really teased out there are three key areas uh, in which we can sort of think about the, the, the region being vulnerable if there are shifts and changes. And so we sort of structure this around three ideas. The first is that there's an industrial structure to the region, or uh, what we call sector specialization. And we do know that communities and regions that have particular cluster strengths, economic strengths, they can be therefore vulnerable to shocks inside of those, right? And so in a region like Waterloo, there's a strong, and I'll show this in a minute, uh, there's a very strong uh, manufacturing sector that's very, you know, very, very concentrated. There's a strong tech sector. It attracts talent in, and a lot of the economic development strategy has been about attracting both firms and people to work in those places. And of course, with the shift to remote work, we have to ask the question, how do we have to change our strategies around, around that piece? And are we aware of the kind of vulnerabilities that might exist um, as global supply chains shift and, and move. And we were particularly thinking here about what happens in medical devices and in other industries that have suddenly become of strategic and domestic importance uh, uh, at, at sort of the national level. And what, what region, you know, is there an opportunity uh, with these sort of two strengths that the region has in manufacturing and tech to really take hold of that? And I think there is, and we've, you know, the Inksmith uh, slash Canadian Shield example speaks to that. Uh, the other, you know, the other question is about what happened, or the second thing is about remote work and the shifts around the work dynamics uh, in an innovation economy. Uh, we certainly think there's this, you know, a risk around the demand for office space. We also see that there's a question about how innovation happens, and there are short and long-term impacts and trade-offs there. Uh, certainly in the short term, everyone has moved remotely who are working in these innovation sectors, but there are important, um, important exchanges that can happen that require face-to-face -face contact. And we sort of speaking to you know, Dean Andre's point earlier about, about discovery, a lot of discovery happens in labs and those are physical settings. They require people to be in particular places. So again, we need to think about what kinds of industrial structures require people to be in particular workplaces uh, rather than just people who can sit at home and, and type on their computer. And what's lost if we shift complete to this remote work? Uh, related to that point, there are both organizational and network effects that are sort of longer term, and this is the literature talks a lot about this, who gets excluded. Uh, I think when we hear the presentation from Professor Worth later, we'll hear more about some of the challenges uh, associated with working from home. Uh, and again, we think, think about the commuting patterns of various sectors of work. And the final point here is about institutions, and here's a place where Waterloo has really shone in, you know, and been able to adapt in previous, uh, when there's been previous sort of bumps and changes in the economy and has demonstrated key resilience and it's because of the strength of local institutions. And I think that's an important point to raise here. I can have a next slide. I'm gonna go through the data very quickly. This slide is um, just to demonstrate the strengths of the region. Anything in the top right corner are things that where there's a strong concentration of um, employment, it's large and it's growing, right? And so I think here we can see both um, manufacturing, medical devices, automotive, theater manufacturing sectors, IT, this is the tech piece, and some other kinds of office work. And we, you know, we're not gonna be able to talk, like I said, in a very short period of time, 10 minutes, we can't talk about all of the different dynamics at work, but we emphasize that it's important to recognize this industrial diversity in planning for a post-COVID, post post-pandemic economy. If I can have my next slide, please. Um, we also looked, and we certainly don't expect you to memorize this entire slide, uh, but we you know, wanted to emphasize that, you know, this is sorted uh, top to bottom in terms of the proportion of employment in the region by sector, we wanted to emphasize again that currently or pre-pandemic, there were you know, varying rates of people working from home on a regular basis. We wanted to emphasize diversity in how, um, how much transit was being used and how much active transportation was being used. Uh, and we also wanted to compare this then Statistics Canada started to look at the telework capacity of different sectors. And so we put this sort of together as a bit of, you know, as a, sort of the pieces of a puzzle to try and understand uh, we were sort of project out where might those big impacts be in terms of land use, uh, in terms of you know, the dynamics around work, 
uh, and where a, an economic de development strategy could really smartly target to think about how these things intersect. And one of the things that comes out in this is that you can see that public transportation is used by sectors that are often very low wage. And so we need to think about the equity pieces as well. Uh, and if we're gonna get into all of this, this is sort of comes out in more detail in our white paper. And if I can have the next slide, please. Um, I have about a minute left and I just wanna highlight uh, again with the, the, the um, Inksmith story that there are key local institutions that really allowed, and they're public institutions that allowed it to pivot that quickly. And they are in some cases, unusual suspects, right? So public libraries were important. Uh, maker spaces were important. And then the things we usually expect, public universities, the local tech association, and the role of public procurement. So we want to really emphasize there's a very strong public infrastructure, most of it local, but other layer, layers on as well, that make a transition for this company and potentially others possible that might generate uh, mid-skill jobs in a post-pandemic future. If I can have my last slide. Uh, we really want to emphasize at the end of the day that the pandemic is amplifying and accelerating existing trends. And it's not really, in some cases, it's shifting and creating new opportunities, but there's a lot that's still there that's new, that's new, but it's building on an existing base of economic activity. Uh, and so our, uh, you know, our advice based on what we've done to date would be to really invest strategically in local institutions and consider the role of social infrastructure, whether that be the public libraries that sort of became a surprise uh, important um, important local asset or others. We see the role of daycares and schools right now as being a rather critical uh, critical piece of infrastructure to allow people to work. Uh, and also really thinking carefully about how to anchor talent and firms in a, in a context where you know we've we've often thought about the University of Waterloo as attracting and then being able to retain that talent in a remote situation that maybe have to be rethought as to how we're going to do that. Um, and Finally, we would just emphasize that there's a big equity and inclusion uh, question that really needs to be thought through. We've seen very clearly that the, you know, the, the role of the pandemic has, has been to accentuate those inequalities and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, fascinating to look at, uh, at the regional economy. Um, we're gonna transition now to the second uh, speaker presentation in this particular theme. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, my colleague, Joel Blitt, please. Hi, uh, so thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, so my talk is gonna be about uh, how COVID-19 is gonna impact the future of work. So, so basically the labor market. Uh, and I wanna mention that, um, so some of this work I'm gonna, I'm gonna be presenting today, it's forthcoming Canadian public policy. So if you wanna read more about it, uh, there's a link there and also feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, I also want to say thanks to Kexuan and, and Chuanmo for their fi fantastic help uh, getting data, uh, et cetera. Okay, so, uh, so fundamentally, I'm, I'm interested in looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on the labor market, and we can divide it into the immediate impacts and the longer term impacts. And the immediate impacts are, are fairly obvious, right? So the first thing that happened between February and April uh, there were 5.5 million jobs that were either lost or whose hours were reduced by 50% or more. Uh, it, disproportionately also, the most financially vulnerable were impacted in these job losses. And what we've seen since April is a, a recovery or a partial recovery. I think we've now get, regained about 50% of those lost jobs, uh, but it's been uneven. And so some people have gone back to work much faster than others. And so one much publicized group is parents with young children have obviously been having a harder time getting back into the workforce and especially mothers. Uh, so if we can, in the next slide, uh, you know, this is a snapshot. So here I'm just plotting employment per capita on the, on the vertical axis over the last 10 years. And what you can see is that it was really steady. And then all of a sudden, uh, as of February, 2020, it basically dropped off the face of a cliff. Uh, it has since recovered a little bit. So it recovered a little bit. So, so the trough was in April. It recovered a little bit by May. It recovered a lot by June and a little bit more by July. Okay, so now about 50% of the drop has been recovered. But what we're also seeing is that the recovery is slowing down. And specifically, economists believe that we're not going to get back to pre-crisis levels until the end of 2021. So basically a year from now or more. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that we're in the midst of a real recession. So while the shutdown was self-imposed, while these job losses were self-imposed, we can't just remove the shutdown and go back to normal. We have pretty much removed the shutdown, but we're going to be struggling with this for a long time. 
Okay, so we're in the midst of a real recession. That, that's the key message. Uh, so next slide. And, and so that leads me to talking about what this paper is really about, which is what are gonna be the long run implications of COVID-19. And so specifically what I believe, I'm gonna try and convince you that the long run implications are that we're gonna see a lot of automation and reallocation during this COVID-19 period. And so to be clear, what do I mean by automation? What I mean is changes within firms such that firms are adopting new technologies to replace workers. So whether it's software, robots, or better, more efficient processes or anything of that sort. What reallocation means, it's, it's changes across firms, changes between firms. And so specifically, the less productive, less automated firms are gonna be losing market share and are gonna be losing resources. And those are gonna be going to the more productive, more highly automated firms. Okay, so that's the reallocation process. Now, both automation within firms and reallocation between firms results in the same thing. It results in an economy that's more productive, and it also results in a large number of jobs that are going to be lost. So why am I claiming that this is what's going to happen with COVID-19? Well, what I did was I went back and looked at previous history. So if we can move on to the next slide. And what the previous history shows is, is pretty clear. Okay, so what am I showing here? So again, on the vertical axis, I have employment per capita. And I've divided employment by routine jobs and non-routine jobs. And what you can see is that non-routine jobs over the last 30 years have been going up. Non-routine jobs, on the other hand, have been going down. Okay, so this is basically since about 1985, 1987, which coincides roughly with the beginning of the ICT revolution, of the information communications technology revolution. It turns out that the pattern I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show you here in a second was not true before the beginning of the ICT revolution, which also lends credence to the arguments that I'm making. And so what we see is that this drop in non-routine, sorry, in routine jobs over the last 30 years was not consistent. As a matter of fact, it's only over 20% of this time period that pretty much all of these routine jobs were lost. What is that 20% of the time period? Well, it's the area shaded in gray. Those are the three recessions that we have suffered since 1987. And, and I mean, I personally find this, this picture shocking. It's like clockwork, right? So the, the number of routine jobs are pretty steady. You're going along, you hit a recession, and the number of routine jobs just drops like a stone. And then it pretty much stabilizes again, a little bit of up and down here, but it hits the next recession and it again drops like crazy. And it keeps doing exactly that. If we can move on to the next slide. So this is just zooming in on these three different recessions I was just mentioning. And you see the exact same thing, right? So what you see is non-routine jobs are generally not affected during recessions. Routine jobs are, take a big hit. And the key that we see here is that they never recover. So the jobs, the routine jobs that are lost during recessions never come back. Why is that? Because they're being automated away or they're being reallocated. Okay, so this is why, this is what I think we're going to see during COVID-19. Now, the key question, of course, is, is COVID-19 going to be different? So, that I, I, so next slide. So it is going to be different, but I think it's going to be different in the sense that the impact on automation and reallocation is going to be even bigger. First of all, this is a much bigger recession than any previous recession that we've seen, at least in, in recent memory, especially since, uh, you know, relative to the last two. But secondly, on top of the usual recessionary incentives and pressures to automate, to reallocate, there are now health incentives to automate and reallocate that are being superimposed on top of those recessionary pressures. And so now we actually have two, two big, huge forces working together towards automation and reallocation. So what are these health incentives? Well, in terms of automation, imagine that you're a firm and you know that you've got certain operations which you don't want to be shut down. Well, the biggest risk your operations are your people. So either A, they can get sick or B, the government poses a shutdown. Well, how are you gonna mitigate those risks and how are you gonna protect your workers at the same time? Well, the way you're gonna do it is you're gonna try and minimize worker-to-worker -worker interaction and you're gonna try and put in more worker-to-robot or worker-to-computer interactions. You're basically gonna try and replace workers with machines. And the more workers you replace with machines, the more you're going to mitigate these risks to your operations. In terms of reallocation, we can also make a similar story. There's gonna be firms that are going to be highly uh, less automated those firms are probably going to suffer more disruption to the operations with people getting sick or the government imposing a shutdown. 
And when that happens, they're either going to lose market share or potentially might even go bankrupt altogether. And those resources, that market share, are going to be going to more automated firms. Okay, so again, these health incentives are going to superimpose on top of the, the usual recessionary pressures to really create a huge economic transformation, automation reallocation, during the COVID-19 crisis. So I, I'm hoping I've, I've largely convinced you that we are going to see a really big effect. The next question we can ask is, well, what industries are going, are we going, in what industries are we going to see the biggest effects? And so I'm gonna focus on these health incentives for a second. And we can think, okay, well, what industries are going to, so what industries are we going to see that workers, uh, that there's a big risk to workers? Well, it's gonna be those industries where workers are working very closely to other workers, where the average worker is in close proximity to other workers. So if we can go on to the next slide. So here, what I'm plotting on the vertical axis is for each of these different industries, what is the extent of physical proximity that workers require to work in those areas? So for example, in healthcare, people work very close to other people, but also in education, in hotels, in food services, and in, real and in retail trade. But where healthcare and retail trade are very different is in the degree to which automation is possible. So how feasible is automation? And so I've also plotted on the horizontal axis, the fraction of workers in routine occupations that are doing routine jobs. And so the key difference here is that retail trade and healthcare might have similar incentives to automate, but retail trade is able to feasibly automate because a lot of the jobs are routine. And so what are the four big areas that are most uh, automatable? Well, it would be retail, the areas in the top right, right? So it'd be retail trade, construction, manufacturing, and transportation and warehousing. So what does that mean for the region of Waterloo? Well, we can look at it in two ways. If we can go to the next slide, please. So, if, so we can look at it from the point of view of occupation. So it turns out that in, K, in, the, in the KWCMA, 44% of workers are working in routine occupations. That's actually quite high. It means that a good chunk of us are at risk of being automated away. That compares, so that's, that's pretty high compared to the Canadian average, which is 38%. In the next slide, we can look at this from the perspective of industry. And again, as Tara was showing, manufacturing is the biggest employer in the region, followed by retail trade, followed by healthcare, et cetera. So I've ranked them in terms of size of employment. And what you see is that our two biggest employers are, are two of the four industries that are at the highest risk of significant automation during this transformation. In the interest of time, I won't go into the details if we can go to the next slide. So what does this all mean? Well, the, the first key point here is I think that we don't talk enough and policymakers are not aware enough. We don't talk about it enough in the popular press, et cetera, that COVID-19 is going to create a very large transformation of our economy through automation and reallocation. I think this is going to be one of the enduring legacies. Waterloo region itself is going to be disproportionately affected. Now, is this a good or bad thing? Well, it's a little bit of both. I, I'd say it's mostly a good thing. So the transformation should be encouraged. So for example, the, the current wage subsidy that we still have at the federal level, I think needs to be scrapped relatively soon because it's actually stifling this transformation that needs to take place. So this transformation is gonna make us richer. This is a fantastic thing, but the, key, but the key thing we have to remember is that the benefits and costs are gonna be unevenly distributed. And so this becomes a policy issue. We have to make sure that everyone benefits from the transformation and not just a few. The one silver lining that I see that I wanna end with here is I see, increased solidarity in the public among fellow Canadians and an increased belief in the role of government. And I think this presents a historic opportunity to reimagine our social contract, our social safety nets, to make sure that all Canadian benefits uh, benefit from this technological change and from future crises to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Uh, the final presentation in our opening theme area on economy and work is gonna be delivered by Professor Nancy Worth. So, Nancy. Thanks very much. So I'm Nancy Worth, a faculty member in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. You'll also hear from my co-author, PhD, PhD candidate, Alkim Karadzic. So at the end of May, the front page of the Globe and Mail proclaimed 2020 as the year the office died. And on the very same day, the National Post declared the office is over. But is this true? And what would this mean for the workers in the region of Waterloo? So our white paper examines the impact of changing work arrangements in the context of COVID-19. So a work arrangement involves where people work, how many hours they work, and their schedules. And our paper just focuses on that first part, 
the challenges and opportunities of where people work. And we're emphasizing an equity lens. An equity lens is really vital for two reasons. First, it helps make policies that address the needs of those who are most affected by this pandemic and its economic impacts. And two, considering equity helps the region be more resilient to cope with future crises. So Alcan's gonna start us off here with workers who can't work from home. Alcan, over to you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, yeah, so long before the pandemic, studies on telecommuting in Canada had already shown that about 60% of jobs are not compatible with remote working. Uh, so we've grouped those who can't work from home into the essential and uh, non-essential workers. So the essential labor force, more known as frontline workers, are majority employed in high touch uh, services such as healthcare, grocery stores, delivery services, um, where remote work is impossible. Uh, the second category is workers in wholes uh, wholesale and retail trade, uh, accommodation and food services, and the hospitality industry who have experienced some of the largest employment declines over the first two months of the lockdown. So as these sectors are dominated by hourly uh, part-time and majority unprotected work, uh, these workers might not be getting uh, called back to their jobs in the post-pandemic era. So the takeaway here is that not being able to work from home is precarious as non-essential workers face uh, unemployment uh, and essential frontline workers risk their health and the health of those around them. So we looked at the consequences of changing work arrangements for those who can't work from home in three areas. The first is sectoral inequalities. So essential services are not um, limited to the functions performed by frontline workers. That means uh, there is a wider group of workers in sectors such as sanitation, food production, and maintenance um, and construction where invisible on-demand and mostly unprotected uh, essential work persists. So the majority minimum wage migrant workers in these sectors are more vulnerable to outbreaks and infections uh, due to fewer resources and language barriers. So recent reports on agricultural production, uh, for example, reveal that migrant workers are less likely to socially distance and receive decent food, uh, income, or health information during quarantine while their work has intensified. So the second area is inequalities in care economy. So COVID-19 has revealed how important uh, care work is to society, yet how undervalued it is. So women are on the front lines of the pandemic. As we know, like 81% of the healthcare and social assistance workforce is made up of women. Many care workers who face extreme vulnerabilities uh, during the crisis, yet are racialized women. Also, asylum seekers make up of a large portion of the personal support workers in nursing and homes across Canada. So during the pandemic, they keep working in multiple facilities, risking job losses and deportation if they get sick. Um, so therefore, a more socially just economic recovery requires acknowledging and prioritizing the well-being of the essential workers those behind the scenes, as much as the people who benefit from their care. So the fi finally, the third is gender-based inequalities, um, remain shaping the work landscape, both during the economic shutdown, as well as the recovery. So women are more likely to be left to choose between care responsibilities at home and securing income. Uh, so the figure here shows that employment losses, both among men and women were more severe in hourly paid jobs uh, with losses in working hours are more common among hourly paid women. Moreover, women who lost the majority of their usual work hours uh, were the ones with children under age six, suggesting childcare, uh, home schooling and domestic work are still considered as primarily women's resp responsibility during uh, COVID-19. So moving forward in June, Uh, was more advanced among men and slowest for women with school age children. So with the reopening of yet childcare is unavailable, uh, women are still more likely to lose their jobs. 
dropping out of the labor force. So that means uh, we should consider gender conscious recovery programs, uh, ensuring access to safe, affordable, uh, and high quality care. So I'll leave it to Nancy here to continue with working from home. Thank you. Thanks, Alkim. I've got the work from home section. So before the pandemic, few Canadians work from home. Our best measure is about 13% of employees were in jobs where any of their scheduled hours could be worked from home. And that's an important, it's not that 13% of jobs were working from home, it's any of their scheduled hours. But by the end of March, just a few weeks into the pandemic, 40% of Canadians were working from home and presumably for all of their hours as most offices were closed. So within a few weeks of the start of the pandemic, Canadians reached the estimated maximum capacity of work from home potential of the labor market at 40%. So as Alkin was saying earlier, 60% of workers cannot work from home and this work from home workforce maxes out at 40%. Workers who were able to work from home are more likely to be salaried rather than hourly employees. They're also more likely to be highly educated and highly paid. And as a result, these workers were the least likely to lose their jobs due to COVID-19 and were the fastest to bounce back to near normal employment by June. The key takeaway here is that the flexibility of being able to work from home is a privilege, allowing workers to maintain both employment and personal health. So we've identified three areas of consideration for those who can work from home. And the first is cost. At the outset, at the outset there's a significant cost involved in setting up or improving a home office space which includes setting up the technology of virtual meetings like this, as well as making the physical space suitable for full-time hours. Right now, I'm speaking to you from a dining room table, as probably many of the panelists are today. And while some employers are granting credits to purchase office furniture and computers, this is not a universal practice. The biggest savings for work from home, of both time and money, involves commuting. Yet savings in Waterloo region may be small, as we already have the second shortest commute in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, with most commuters living within 10 kilometers of their workplaces. The second issue we identified is the issue of work-life balance. So a popular lament you may have seen circulating on Twitter lately is that we're not working from home, we're living at work. And what research has found is that productivity often increases in work from home arrangements, but often in ways that are damaging to workers, such as workers who take fewer breaks when they work from home. Or some workers work more due to a fear of unemployment, what's been termed recently a fear-based productivity, especially notable at the beginning of the pandemic when people weren't sure what jobs would continue. But it's important to mention that for some workers, working from home offers much needed flexibility. In one of the most famous work from home studies that really tried to measure the impact of whether work from home arrangements would be long lasting into the future, the travel agency C-Trip experimented with sending workers home to work or having them work in the office. And after the experiment, they gave their workers the choice and half wanted to return and half wanted to stay home. So it's a really complex picture in terms of what work-life balance offers in the work from home space. And echoing Alkin's final point, my third consideration is around care responsibilities defaulting to women. So similar to the gendered impacts of those who can't work from home, there's a gendered inequality to work from home arrangements as well. So while Collins et al in some recent research surmised that the transition to work from home might make invisible domestic and caring labor more obvious to fathers, According to US data collected before and during the pandemic, for dual earner couples able to work from home, mothers with young children have reduced their work hours four to five times more than fathers. Consequently, the gender gap in work hours has grown 20 to 50% for those working from home with young children. We conclude our paper with some suggestions about how to support the economic recovery of those who can't work from home and those adjusting to the new normal of the home office. In particular, we emphasize childcare and elder care as important social infrastructures that support economic growth, as well as opportunities to keep highly skilled workers in the region. And we'll end it there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. 
um, we now have the opportunity to um, engage in a bit of a Q&A session with uh, the three different presenters or presentations that we've heard thus far on this topic of uh, economy and, and work, sorry, uh, in the region. So to begin with, uh, I've got a question from the Q&A forum um, for uh, Tara and Marcus in terms of their work. Um, and that question relates to, um, I guess, the role of technology and the question of, of equity and access in terms of um, how it impacts the different communities within the region. So technology as, as being um, something that is very much an influence on equity, i.e. not everyone has access to the technology and can participate in that part of the economy. So that's something that um, you examined within the context of your work. Marcus, do you want to jump in or do you want me to go ahead? Go ahead, Tara. Okay, perfect. So, I mean, what we were looking at really is more industrial structure, right? And employment and those kinds of questions. So, you know, the access to technology piece and of which there's a large literature on the digital divide around those things is, is of less concern in this particular piece because we were interested in the, in the tech sector as an industry in and of itself. And we were interested in how it's, you know, locational calculus is shifting um, and, and you know, what they're thinking about in terms of those things. And we do have some concerns around that. Um, particularly, we know that the tech sector has, you know, has, has, has based in the longer run real questions around um, diversity and inclusion. Um, when, when things shift into an online environment, uh, often what happens is those, those, those challenges are amplified. And I think that speaks particularly to the same kinds of arguments that uh, Nancy and Alkim are making as well about, about who may be included or excluded um, in this shift. Um, and so that's the concern there, but we really didn't, uh, we didn't really address head on the question of the, the, the underlying technologies which have facilitated the shift to uh, remote work in some, in some areas of the economy. But I think what's actually important is to remember the point made by, by, um, by Nancy and Alkim that in fact there's a very large proportion of work and the same statistic shows up in ours as well in terms of the ca capacity of particular forms of work to even be uh, conducted remotely, right? So this is, I think that's an important piece to bear in mind that there's still a large part of the economy that happens in real places and in, you know, in bricks and mortar structures. And even though, even when it's happened remotely, it's still doing that, it's just in a different place, right? So. For sure. And in, in, in your work at all, and, and maybe again, in your conversations, I mean, um, a lot of emphasis pre-COVID on the sort of Waterloo, Toronto sort of tech corridor, um, how is your perspective on that, uh, having gone through the, the project that you just completed in, in terms of, especially the long view, right, the 2041 view? Right, and I think this is here, there's a question about, um, uh, which we sort of raised about uh, whether or not this question of talent attraction is going to matter in the same way or how it might matter. Uh, and in fact, if you think about what we ended up concluding is in fact that there's, it's sort of doubling down on ensuring that there's an infrastructure in place and that includes social infrastructure that might allow um, a region like Waterloo to continue to attract talent to, to those industries and if they are being conducted remotely, if they, even if work is still remote. Um, that, that will be a necessary piece of, of what has to happen. Uh, there's questions about the housing market. I think Marcus is in a better position to answer those or to address those than I am, but that there's a housing price piece. And I think there continues to be a question about uh, connectivity along that corridor. And that, I don't think that question is going away, um, thinking through both the shorter and the longer term. And I think the innovation questions are important in this as well. Um, what we do know is that there's an enormous amount um, of benefit to those sort of random encounters that help with problem solving, industrial problem solving, uh, whether it be in tech in, or in other forms of economic activity. And, um, and while the short term view is all this remote work is great, even in sector, you know, even in these sort of that 40% of work that can be done at home, but there are some economic losses and productivity losses in the longer run. And in fact, the productivity question is important here too, is very uneven. Finance, there's the productivity has increased other sectors of the economy, that's not been true. So there's a lot of a lot of um, assumptions that are made about the benefit of this of, of remote work that that I think are are much more complicated and complex on the ground. Yeah, and and certainly perspectives on remote work have evolved over the last three or four months as well, right? It's like if you look at polls and responses to things, it's been yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> Depends on whether the kids are screaming in the background at that moment. Right? Yeah, 
I, I hear you. Um, a question for Joel uh, related to uh, maybe you could expand a little bit and give us some more examples on um, the, di the distinctions between routine and, and non-routine jobs. And, uh, you know, when is there a danger that some sort of non-routine jobs, depending on how technology evolves, may also become routine at some point in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Let, uh, let me, before I answer that question, let me uh, just add uh, or agree with Tara. So I, I do a lot of work uh, I, I, as well on, on looking at innovation and the extent to which uh, geographical proximity really matters. And, and I think the pendulum has swung a little bit too far in the direction of, hey, we don't have to all be in the same place. We can all do remote working. Uh, the, the personal interactions are extremely important for innovation. I think in creative sectors, uh, for coming up with new ideas, new projects, new anything, uh, it's gonna be extremely important. And I think all of these firms that are thinking that they can just send all of their workers remote and that you know, virtual meetings are gonna have the same impact are, are really sort of missing the, uh, they're missing the point that there's a, a flavor that can only be had through so actual social interaction that you can't replicate online. And so I think the pendulum is going to swing back. It'll never go back to where we were before, but people are gonna realize that personal in physical interactions are important and there will always be a hub for that. There has to be, especially in, in high tech uh, creative industries. Uh, so I agree with Tara completely. Okay, to, to the question about routine versus not routine. Uh, so so the, the, the cop out is uh, go look at the paper where I actually define sort of what industries. It, it, it's, it's done relatively roughly and I've relied on, on what, how people have defined it in the past. But basically a routine job is a job that uh, is repetitive that you can codify, right? That, that you can pretty easily say you do this, then you do that sort of discrete steps. Uh, so things like uh, obviously a manufacturing plant, so if you're working on, on a manufacturing line, if you're always doing the same thing to a widget, that would be routine. But also, you know, if you're, um, if you're at a supermarket the, at the doing the checkout, that is also considered routine. And Walmart has already announced that they're getting, and at least one store, they're getting rid of all the checkout clerks, right? Because they think they don't need them anymore. So they're, they're trying that. Uh, but it also goes to a, a bunch more areas. So for example, sales support, bookkeepers, uh, there are all sorts of, of functions that are now being routinized by new technologies now. So, you know, to Clarence's point, maybe the examples I gave were the routine jobs at the beginning. Now with AI, there's going to be way more things that are going to be routine in quotation marks that might not have been easy to uh, automate in the past, but will be very soon. And one of the interesting things is that it used to be that it was uh, relatively low skilled or at the very end and, and, and uh, occupations that were in the middle of the skill distribution that were routine and were hollowed out by the ICT revolution. But now that's changing because the new technologies and AI in particular are also affecting some of the higher end, you know, traditionally white collar jobs. And so the, its impact on society, on wages, on inequality is going to be different. Although I still believe it'll be like the ICT revolution that's going to increase inequality. Right, and, and a somewhat related question, Joel. Um, will the high rates of unemployment persist for the foreseeable future? Um, and, you know, how do we, as a society, how do we uh, respond to or, or provide employment for those people that, um, who lose their jobs and can't adapt to a new economy? So, so what, two, two double barrel question there, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Okay, so, so let me answer this in, in two ways. So every time there's been an, a, a technological transformation, a, an innovative revolution, right? And, and the most recent one, of course, was the ICT revolution, but you can go back to the industrial revolution. The thing that happens in the short run is that people lose their jobs. Uh, and as economists, sometimes we, we dismiss that short run too quickly. And we say, well, you know, eventually new industries spring up. And so we don't have to worry about this. Everyone will find new jobs in new industries, et cetera. Right? We often dismiss it. The reality is that that period in between where people lose their jobs and until new jobs spring up can sometimes be a really long time. If you go back to the industrial revolution, real wages, so we all think of the industrial revolution as a good thing, but real wages didn't surpass pre-industrial revolution levels for 50 years after the beginning of the industrial revolution. If you were joining the workforce at the beginning of the industrial revolution, 
you would not have said that it was a good thing because it wasn't for those words. Okay, so we, we, there is going to be a lot of upheaval in the short run. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs, and, we, and that is a policy issue. I'm, for example, in favor of a guaranteed minimum income. Uh, but the, what I think is the even bigger issue is that in the middle to long run, it's going to increase inequality. So those people that have skills that are, that are complementary to these technologies are gonna benefit hugely. Their wages are gonna go way up, which is exactly what we saw with the ICT revolution. That is, most economists think that is the biggest reason why inequality has been increasing over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, and those that have skills that are substitutable with the new technologies are going to lose their jobs and probably have to find jobs at lower wages in service sectors. And so that is a real, real worry and one that we need to tackle from a policy perspective, right? We need to be able to tax. So more and more of the value creation is, is now algorithms and data and all these intangible assets that are really hard to tax. Labor is easy to tax. Those things you can set up in the Cayman Islands. So how are we going to tax those things that are generating the value and redistribute it to all of these Canadians and, and have a guaranteed minimum income, et cetera? I think this is a serious policy question and it needs to be addressed multilaterally at the international level. And it's one of the things that keeps me up at night. Yeah, thank you. Um, so final question, and given our, our timing, I, I think this relates to um, um, Nancy's presentation around uh, the, the people that were working from home early in the pandemic. Do we know a little bit more detail about sort of the sectors that they were involved in? Um, Sure. I guess across Tara's and Joel's presentations as well, it's those yeah. that in the knowledge economy most broadly that were able to make that shift really easily. People that were already working from home maybe a day a week or an afternoon a week that could leverage that flexibility into that permanent work from home arrangement. Those of us that might even have a home office they just moved into full time. I think what the real challenge is is those that are on the edge of those transitions where the costs are really prohibitive, they don't have the space, the technology, and there is a, a real role for the region in terms of supporting those workers and workers that are sort of between the can work from home, can't work from home. So in our, our white paper, we talk about a couple of regions in uh, Italy that are thinking about digital lit literacy and offering sort of digital toolboxes of resources for their most vulnerable citizens in terms of helping them make this transition or even have uh, some more services that are available to them in this new normal that happened in, in a few short weeks in terms of making the work from home space available to more people rather than uh, these existing barriers that we have at the moment. Uh, it's interesting. I, mean, I was just going to ask you about, you know, as you were doing your work, what was uh, an example of a great case study that you saw where uh, a community had made those kind of investments already um, beyond the Italian examples or another one that comes to mind? Well, I think just more broadly in terms of the debate between universal basic income and how do we support people in making those transitions, I'm actually more in favor of universal basic services as, as a way of supporting people in terms of free bus passes, free internet, and that allows uh, work to really become something that is socially valued rather than something that is, uh, well, we could have a longer debate about universal basic income, but I think universal basic services offers a real step forward in terms of supporting workers in all sectors of the labor market. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, on behalf of, of the audience watching, I just wanted to thank uh, all three presenters in our, our first session and, and thank you for the questions as well. Just as a reminder to the audience to, to keep the questions coming in. We may not have a chance to get to all of them. Uh, some of them relate specifically to the presentation. Some of them are uh, perhaps more of interest to the region. Uh, and not only is the session being recorded, but again, the question and answers and the questions are being recorded as well. So um, I just want to let you know that that voice is being heard. Um, so if we could move on to our next theme area, um, supporting the economy and work, of course, is infrastructure and something that the region has uh, tremendous responsibilities in. So we're going to uh, begin our infrastructure presentation with a, a 20 minute uh, broad ranging presentation and I'd like to ask uh, Nadine Ibrahim uh, to start us off. Nadine. All right, thank you Clarence. I have the pleasure to present uh, to you the researchers behind uh, this topic here. So we'll start off the infrastructure piece uh, with the topic titled Can Our Public Infrastructure 
weather the COVID-19 storm, uh, with a little pun on words here. And it, the, the water related infrastructure that is the first piece here is really four topics in one and uh, the speakers will be in that order. So um, it'll be uh, the starting off with the wastewater infrastructure being the water, uh, the wastewater that has uh, traces of all human activities. So wastewater will be our starting point uh, with uh, Wayne Parker presenting, followed by stormwater uh, with Bruce McViker presenting and then drinking water uh, with Kimia Agasadegi presenting, and then we'll wrap it up uh, with asset management being the one that encompasses the operations and the financials and the decision-making around the public infrastructure with Annalisa Schmidt to wrap it off. And, um, and we are all in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Waterloo. And we'll pass on the microphone from uh, one to the other as we go through the presentation. So I'll pass it over to you, Wayne. Thank you very much, Nadine. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about um, wastewater infrastructure and its relationship to the pandemic. Uh, maybe we'll move to the next slide, please. Um, the, so at the very outset, when the pandemic was, was in early days, um, in the wastewater community, the early concerns were really whether um, the active virus might be present in the wastewater through through uh, people's um, releases. Uh, so luckily, uh, at least for this virus, it was identified that um, the active virus is not excreted by humans and, and hence um, from the standpoint of things like worker safety, people who might be handling wastewaters and so on, and also releases to the environment that, that this was not likely an issue when it came to the, the virus itself. Um, not, never say that you know, in future pandemics, it, that, that may not necessarily hold true as every virus is unique into itself. Um, the, one of the things that is kind of interesting uh, that has really, is probably the hottest topic in wastewater research in the last four months is the, is the idea of using um, viral RNA fingerprints in the wastewater as a way to uh, do a community level uh, appraisal of the level of infection in communities. And that is something that as we talk about rebounds and spikes in infection and so on and, and implementing control measures, you know, that the region may want to uh, consider more going forward as a way to uh, monitor community level infections. Um, although that is still a very much a developing science. Uh, it is, however, not really a planning issue as itself. It is, it is a possible thing, though, that the, the region may want to consider as a, as a measure to implement. So having, not, although the, so the virus itself is not really a direct impact on wastewater infrastructure, uh, the concerns are probably more about the indirect effects or potential indirect effects. And... Um, so we've kind of broken this up into uh, impacts on the quantities of wastewater that, that might be generated during a pandemic. And then subsequently we'll talk about uh, the properties of the quality of the wastewater uh, that, that's generated. And uh, so this table um, tries to intuit based upon changes that were happening in the community during the, the height of the pandemic how the quantity of wastewater that might be generated and discharged into sewers might, might change. And so certainly we've seen some industries and so on that, that were shut down. And so in some communities, uh, industrial contributions to the sewer system can be significant. And, and one, would, one would expect to see a reduction in the quantity of wastewater that would need to be handled. In other cases, um, Things like increased activity to healthcare facilities might generate more wastewaters, and, and those wastewaters might have some very unique properties or challenging properties. Uh, other things, other major changes, you know, changes in commuter activity with the region of Waterloo. We have people leaving, uh, commuting out, people commuting back in. Uh, it's a little unknown as to how that would affect the, the quantity of wastewater uh, generated. Certainly we had a lot of university students that uh, 
would have left the region and, and their contributions to sewage generation would, would likely be reduced. Um, we see a lot more hand washing and so on, frequent and quantities, and, and that might increase the quantity of wastewater. Uh, we did a brief review of the, the, the wastewater generation um, in the region during this pan early days of this pandemic, and it suggested that it seemed to all come out in the wash, that there wasn't a significant change from historical trends. Um, but there is evidence in other communities where they did see either significant increases or significant reductions in the quantity of wastewater generated. And so, you know, even breaking going within our region, uh, different parts of the region may, uh, in, in subsequent cases or in, say, rebound situations, there, there may be some, some evolution in here. Moving on, looking at wastewater quality issues, uh, you know, there's the wastewater that we generate is really got the fingerprints of what's going on in the community. Um, and so when we see significant changes in community activities in, in response to pandemics, there's likely going to translate into uh, the wastewater discharges. And so if we use a lot more cleansers and disinfectants, or if we're using antiviral drugs and antibiotic drugs or analgesics, um, increased use of sanitary wipes and masks and so on, all of these materials are likely going to show up at higher levels in the, in the wastewaters that we are generating. And as we'll see later, um, you know, their presence could have implications both with respect to our ability to uh, treat the wastewater but also, and, and also to could potentially even just convey the wastewater to, to the treatment plants in the sewer system. Um, there are other things that, that could be happening. So if you have large industries that are having to discharge uh, materials because they can't sell them or move them, uh, then sometimes those things can be dynamically spiked into the wastewater system and, and cause challenges. And even just changes in consumer habits could, could have Im implications for, for wastewater. So one of the big concerns with respect to wastewater conveyance is if we saw a lot more of fats and greases being discharged in the sewer system because there's a lot more at-home cooking going on uh, and there'd be less control of that. And the presence of those materials might impact on uh, wastewater conveyance systems. So moving on to the next slide, uh, before I talk about sort of what the implications of those wastewater, uh, those changes in quantity and quality are, I want to I talk about a specific issue that, that has a connotation in the planning process, and that is the use of the term resilience versus robustness of wastewater infrastructure. So the, the plans that we have tend to speak to resilience. And resilience really um, refers to the ability of a, of a system or an infrastructure to basically bounce back after a shock or a challenge. And that there can be a certain loss of performance during that time, but, but the system can respond to its original state. Whereas robustness um, requires a higher level of, of treatment or performance. It means that the system needs to continue its uh, level of treatment or, or uh, performance throughout the challenging condition. And there's a lot of talk of resilience in, um, or there's some talk of resilience in, in the planning documents. And a, a lot of the con context for that, I believe, is dealing with things like climate change impacts. So where, where we see short-term uh, pulses, like flooding and so on, and, and needing systems that can can respond after those short-term uh, challenging situations. Uh, as what we're seeing with the pandemic is, is that it is lasting for a very long time. And in that context, we, uh, resilience is perhaps not the right term to be using because our systems really can't uh, lose their performance for such an, an extended period of time. We, we really need robust wastewater treatment systems that can uh, continue to provide a level of treatment through and performance throughout um, a pandemic um, 
scenario. So having said that, move on to my final slide. And that is what would be the implications of some of these uh, changes in wastewater quantities and um, qualities with respect to the wastewater infrastructure. And, and really, when we think about wastewater infrastructure, we're thinking about the ability to convey wastewaters from their source to the treatment, which is primarily the sewer and sewage system. And then the ability to treat those wastewaters to produce uh, final affluents that, that will uh, have limit or minimal effects on the environment. And so uh, when we look at the quantity issue and the ability to convey wastewaters, we uh, our sewers will fail when our flows exceed capacity. So either when we have elevated flows beyond the capacity of the sewers or the capacity of the sewers to convey the wastewaters are reduced. By and large, our guidelines for designing of sewers allow us to handle relatively high flows under many situations, but they don't necessarily uh, account for the fact of, of clogging that, that might happen when we see a combination of what, what I would, we would consider non-flushables, things like wipes and masks being discharged into the sewer system along with elevated levels of fats, oils, and greases. And so when we, if we see a scenario under a pandemic situation where we have a combination of, say, uh, discharge of these uh, materials into the sewer system that are going to reduce the capacity and then perhaps a high flow event as such we see in this in a in a seasonal again a spring season that combination could lead to problems with with conveyance at least in localized scenarios and that is something that perhaps needs to be uh, at least considered when when looking at the planning of sewer systems the other implications I have here are all really related to treatment. And um, we saw earlier that, you know, pandemics might lead to a lot of biocides and antibiotics and so on being discharged into a sewer system, at least under a very severe infection scenario. We rely heavily on biological treatment processes to treat our wastewaters and um, it's conceivable that under a severe scenario, these antibiotics and so on that are biologically active might potentially inactivate some of our wastewater treatment processes. And um, we would need to, we should be thinking about how, measures to prevent that from happening. And not only do those kinds of materials have impacts on the treatment process itself or could have impacts, um, we know that wastewater treatment plants do not perfectly remove these kinds of drugs and pharmaceuticals from the wastewater. So if there are elevated discharges into the wastewater system, a fraction of those will make their way into the downstream system, in, in our case, largely the Grand River, and, and could have impacts on aquatic life there. Uh, and, and that also would provide incentive to, to try and minimize those discharges in, in designs and, and plans. Uh, and kind of related to that issue, but different, is that the presence of high levels of antibiotics um, can also lead to the discharge of antibi antibiotic resistant organisms into the environment, and which could then um, have a be, be recycled back into our, our population and impact our long-term um, public health. Um, so I think my time is just up and I'll pass on now to Bruce McVicker. So I'm not sure if uh, Bruce is on the line with us. So could we maybe advance to uh, the next presenter then in the series? That would be Camille. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I will be talking about the drinking water sector. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So for the drinking water sector, we identified four areas of potential impact. 
Uh, in the interest of time, I will only talk about the first three today. Uh, the fourth one, which is related to operational and maintenance challenges is mentioned in our white paper. Uh, next slide, please. So the first answer, uh, question we tried to answer was whether COVID-19 is a threat for drinking water sources. For any virus to be a threat to water sources, it has to be present in an infectious form in the discharges of the infected individuals to the sewer system. It also has to be persistent in the sewage environment. Uh, some research has been done in this area on the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, uh, and it seems that the risk of transmission of COVID-19 through the fecal oral pathway uh, is low. Additionally, this virus has not been uh, detected in an infectious form in treated or raw wastewater. Uh, the next question we uh, looked into was whether in an unlikely event of source water contamination with SARS-CoV-2 virus, drinking water treatment processes would be effective in inactivating and removing it for supply of safe drinking water. Uh, drinking water treatment processes are designed to remove a number of pathogens, including viruses. And some of these pathogens in general are a lot more resistant to treatment compared to viruses. Although no direct experiments have been done on SARS-CoV-2 uh, in relation to its removal and inactivation in uh, drinking water treatments, based on what we know about its uh, characteristics compared to other pathogens, it is thought that conventional and centralized drinking water treatment processes are effective in its removal and inactivation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second area we looked at was the effect on water consumption. Uh, due to the stay at home orders and the new normal of working from home for many occupations, in addition to increased hand washing and surface cleaning, it is likely that uh, the residential water consumption patterns have changed. It is recommended that water consumption from the different periods of the pandemic to be assessed. And if there has been significant changes, implications for the region's water efficiency plans, and also uh, for the distribution system during high demand conditions uh, should be further assessed. And next slide, please. Uh, and the last area we looked at was the prolonged stagnation of water in the service line and premise plumbing. Due to the pandemic shutdowns, uh, many buildings had low or no water use for weeks or months. Water that has uh, been sitting as stagnant in uh, premise plumbing uh, for a long time is not safe for consumption as it might contain chemical or microbiological contaminants. Uh, to restore water uh, quality in a building, uh, the building plumbing and service line needs to be uh, thoroughly flushed. This is the responsibility of building owners. Fortunately, this issue gained a lot of attention prior to the reopening phase of the pandemic and guidance for proper uh, building plumbing flushing uh, were made available for the building owners. Uh, this is one pandemic experience uh, which we can take advantage of for proactively reducing building water system health risks and developing preventative uh, plans such as site-specific uh, routine flushing. Uh, so uh, that's all for drinking water. Uh, Annalisa, please take it away. Oh, hi. I'm Annalisa and I'll present uh, the infrastructure asset management topic. So this section comes last in the series because it brings together common aspects of the water related infrastructure and more, more directly how to manage infrastructure, invest in it and maintain it and an adequate level of service. Next slide, yes. Yeah. So asset management consists of knowing which assets you have and how much they are worth assessing their condition, deciding if they need to be renewed or replaced, 
and su successfully financing the necessary capital improvements. So the region is responsible for supplying drinking water and treating the wastewater of all the local municipalities, in addition to distributing potable water and collecting wastewater in the townships of North Dumfries and Wellesley. The estimated replacement value for these assets is close to $2 billion, and they represent 37% of the region's asset portfolio. So regarding the assets conditions, uh, 51% are in good or very good condition, 38% in fair condition, and 11% in poor or very poor condition. When we have to decide what to do with an asset, we know that small but timely renewal investments save money when compared to just letting the asset deteriorate and replace it at the end of its useful life. However, Financing capital improvements is very challenging, as the money usually comes from user fees and government funding, to the point where it was recently ranked the second most pressing issue facing the water industry. In the next slide, we have divided the potential COVID-19 challenges for water utilities in short, medium, and long-term challenges. So in the short term, utilities had to sustain operations while adapting to the new, to, uh, new work policies and procurement challenges, for instance, for uh, procuring PPE. Also, data from an AWWA survey points out that only 11% of other utilities had a specific contingency plan for a pandemic scenario. However, the most pressing challenging re challenge right now is the negative impact on cash flow caused by customer relief measures as the suspension of other shutoffs and payment deferrals and a steep reduction in non-residential water consumption. On the top of that, we have the deferral of planned fees increases, further jeopardizing revenues. In the long term, we foresee difficulties in financing uh, planning capital improvements, which may cause the deferral of some planned projects with possible implications to levels of, of service. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the opportunities for the region of Waterloo include uh, reviewing the contingency plans. So now that we have accepted that unlikely scenarios do occur from time to time, like this pandemic, no one ever imagined that, it could be beneficial to reassess, for instance, climate change scenarios for contingency plans. Also, uh, increase operation automation to increase systems autonomy, as uh, Joel's put so well. Um, explore alternative funding options. So. Sure, let's plan for the shovel-ready projects, but let's also consider other alternatives like P3 projects. Uh, and we will likely not have enough funding available for planned capital projects. So reviewing decision-making criteria for project prioritization is paramount. For instance, projects that would increase infrastructure resilience or system automation will have preference over the ones that don't. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the alternatives for overcoming challenges could focus on automation and data management solutions. So data management is key for identifying what assets need to be renewed or replaced and when. And automation would increase the system's autonomy and potentially reduce operational costs, which is our second point. Uh, so this is something the region already focuses on, but that could be expanded, especially by studying new technologies to reduce energy consumption, chemicals, and personnel costs. And finally, we evaluating the long-term financial planning, including how to prioritize and fund future, future projects could be beneficial to identify and address infrastructure gaps. So I just want to leave you with one thought, and it is uh, we never know what the next crisis will bring. So we have to insert flexibility in how we manage assets, be consistent about project prioritization and plan for infrastructure resilience. Thanks.
Hello? <clears throat> Hello? Okay, so I think I'm uh, live now. Uh, sorry for the mix up. Um, if everybody can hear me, uh, I'll proceed here. So we're thinking about storm water. Uh, and in this context, we're thinking about storm water. If I could move to the uh, second slide, please. We're thinking about storm water as a threat uh, due to the flood risk. So that's uh, commonly known, but we should also be thinking about storm water as a resource to mitigate what are long-term and potentially much more significant risks of biodiversity loss and climate change. So if you haven't been thinking about stormwater recently, and probably most of you have not, it's not just about drainage. Uh, so on the right is an example of a greenfield development plan that first identified the existing drainage and the natural heritage features within this block formed by the streets A through D. So in this case, there were wetlands in the middle of the block and some ditches from the farmer's fields that were identified as locations uh, for possible stormwater management strategies. And they implemented an overall strategy of <clears throat> low impact development. So it's generally recognized that flood and climate change resilience is maximized when we maintain and enhance the natural heritage of the landscape as part of the urban development. So uh, Matt Yanetta, <clears throat> my co-authors, research is actually related to this as we're asking the question of whether the urban development uh, could possibly improve on the existing rural condition of the watershed, which of course has uh, problems of its own. So next slide, please. Uh, the principles of stormwater management and low impact development are well recognized in the uh, regional official plan. So some of this is just things you would have uh, already put in place. On the left are a few of the relevant sections that make explicit or explicit uh, uh, implicit uh, reference to the stormwater management. So I've summarized a few of the relevant existing goals as the need to one, identify the system of existing and potential natural areas and open spaces to access or maximize the, the myriad benefits for residents and the environment. Uh, secondly, we're, we need to protect source water where stormwater uh, can contain high levels of salt and other contaminants. So that's a particular concern in the Waterloo region. And then three, to integrate stormwater management goals with the system of natural and green spaces. So ideally the green space network would be also a stormwater management network as shown in the previous slide. And though this is not always possible to retrofit in developed urban areas, we can look for opportunities to do so. So these goals show up in various ways <clears throat> in the current region of Waterloo strategic plan where focus area three is environment and climate action. Natural heritage appears in this plan as does the goal of creating community-based climate adaptation plans. So these goals uh, then trickle down to official municipal plans where things like sustainable development, green streets and low impact development are emphasized. And in stormwater management plans where recent updates in Kitchener and Waterloo in particular describe recommended approaches that align with the overall goal of improving the stormwater management system to address a broader range of goals than just drainage. So next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> so the good news that we've heard uh, from Wayne is that uh, wastewater is not a likely transmission pathway for uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we have found no studies that look specifically at stormwater in terms of transmission pathways, but the wastewater conclusion likely applies equally well to stormwater. Uh, in other pandemics, again, as Wayne emphasized, this is not necessarily the case. So a continued emphasis on ensuring that there is not cross-contamination with direct uh, wastewater connections to stormwater pipes is, is still essential. Uh, there have been some studies, uh, again, similar to what Wayne was talking about uh, on the issue of stormwater quality, because there is a potential for contamination with disinfectants and the discarded PPE. Um, uh, and that getting into the, uh, the drainage system and the uh, creek system downstream. Uh, so other research has also focused on the problem of air quality and the different rates of transmission in different cities. So why they might be higher in one city or the other. So air quality is strongly affected by things like trees, which from our perspective are really uh, vertical stormwater management facilities. Uh, so the goals of improving air quality can be strongly linked with uh, improving stormwater management. Uh, and then there's a number of studies that highlight the changes in people in people's movements and attitudes that make this moment uh, perhaps an opportunity to implement changes that promote health and improve long-term uh, climate change resilience. Uh, so last slide, please. 
So the conclusion from this portion of the pre presentation is really to emphasize opportunities. Again, I'm presenting your work back to you, but this is a good opportunity for green streets. So the picture on the left is from the city of Waterloo where they, they've proposed a Woo Nerf system uh, for a, or a green street for large street uh, near the university. So lower traffic means that this is a good time to do these types of projects and they can be significant for stormwater management improvements. Uh, the second opportunity is based on the strategic goal of community-based action, climate action plans. So the picture on the right is from a SNAP plan in Toronto, where the idea is to create a plan for a developed area, um, identify the current natural heritage features and drainage patterns, and then look for opportunities to combine water and green space to add real functionality to the green space system. So for stormwater management, that means more trees, disconnected downspouts, rain gardens, bioremediation, this is a good opportunity for that. The number one barrier to such a plan identified by the TRCA is really homeowners' attention. So everyone is busy, but now uh, with people much more aware of their local environments and this feeling that we're, we were able to respond in a massive coordinated way to address a threat, the thought is that it uh, will be easier to engage with communities uh, to think about what changes that can be made to address longer term problems. So I'll hand it back to you, Clarence. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we're now gonna move on to the uh, second presentation in the infrastructure series, sorry, dealing with roads. Um, in terms of our timing, uh, we're off slightly and I just wanna assure everyone will uh, get back on track uh, during the Q&A period. And our goal will be to uh, try and start uh, Professor Moe's presentation promptly at 2.25. So that's where we're gonna head. And another reminder to everyone to please, as you're listening to these presentations, there's lots of uh, uh, thoughtful elements to it. If you've got a question, fire it into the Q&A section uh, and we'll have a chance to not only address it during the Q&A period, but also the region itself would appreciate uh, your questions as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our road presentation, please. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Senata Nahiri, briefly uh, Atta, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Waterloo. And I'm pleased to present the highlights of the white paper entitled as Can COVID-19 Benefit the Health of Our Assets and Humans? This presentation was prepared under the supervision of Professor Susan Tai and Professor Nadine Ibrahim. Can we go to the next slide? Land transport is the most common transportation mode and therefore roads and bridges as major components of this mode are at high level of deterioration risk. Consequently, in order to maintain the serviceability and quality of these assets, we need to plan and set up both time and cost efficient work zones. Based on the current Waterloo Regional Plan, roads should provide a safe, direct, accessible and multimodal transportation for all users. To achieve this goal, well-organized work zones and well, uh, work plans by considering the possible impacts of them on the neighborhoods and societies is mandatory. And we go to the next slide. These three graphs compare the congestion level of five major cities all around the world, namely Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, New York, and Rome in three different dates in 2019 and 2020. The graph in the left-hand side demonstrate the congestion levels uh, on March 5th in 2019 and 2020, almost a week earlier than WHO's official announcement of world pandemic. This graph shows that the congestion levels are more or less constant in all five cities in both 2019 and 2020, very minor fluctuation. World Health Organization officially announced COVID-19 as pandemic on March 11, 2020. However, Rome was affected by this virus earlier than other four major cities. Therefore, local government had already banned and limited non-essential trips, which could be clearly seen in the bar associated with the Rome in the middle graph. Also, there are some signs of reduction in congestion levels of other four cities. Almost a week after WHO's announcement on March 19, 2020, congestion levels dropped significantly in all cities in comparison with the same date in 2019. Based on the available statistics, Toronto experienced the most reduction in congestion level among all other cities involved in this comparison. Can we go to the next slide? Highway construction and maintenance highly depends on the configuration of the work zones, their duration and the traffic volume they can accommodate. 
War zones generally cause challenging traffic scenarios due to their nature. Road-related road factors, such as changes in family or path of the motorists, lane closures, and substandard surface of the pavements are some of these challenges. Also, alternation in geometry of the roads because of war zone can potentially heighten the rate of conflicts, major injuries, and fatalities for both workers and motorists. Higher user delay costs and enhanced grease and greenhouse gas emissions due to longer construction periods, queuing, and detours are the other significant concerns associated with the war zones. Next slide, please. Apart from the limitations and concerns that COVID-19 brought to our modern societies and industries, it also offered us some unique experiences in construction field. Pre-pandemic, setting of war zones was only limited to off-peak hours, mostly nights, and it was not feasible to have full closures on crowded areas and highways. Nighttime closures uh, were generally preferred to avoid high user delay costs and congestion. However, they had some other major issues such as exposing workers to more impaired drivers, less visibility for both drivers and workers, and several other factors. The stay-at-home order because of COVID-19 gave construction companies and contractors the opportunity of shutting down the highways and crowded areas without or at least minimizing the concerns about the user delay costs. Studies in this period actually showed full closures could be faster and more efficient. For example, the subway project in Los Angeles County that crosses through the famous Beverly Hills city is currently progressing faster than before. This project experienced many delays since the area was highly populated and setting up war zones were quite expensive and challenging. Also on August 15 and 16, 2020, a couple of days ago, Don Valley Parkway located in east of Toronto was fully closed for maintenance and rehabilitation activities. Although DVP is one of the major highways of Toronto, no significant congestion was reported by Google Maps and streets around it. The other positive impact of COVID-19 was on environment and uh, climate. As you can see in this uh, figure in the right-hand side, the level, of, uh, the level of air pollution reduced significantly in and around GTA. Initial studies show that this reduction happened because of less consumption of fossil fuels by vehicles and buildings, and big part of it are going to like uh, construction vehicles. Some of the details of responsive, uh, responses of other countries and regions to COVID-19 are actually summarized in the paper, which will be available at the end of the month. Uh, next slide, please. Last but not least, COVID-19 helped us to rethink and reevaluate our conventional strategies, guidelines, and safety measures. To have better comeback and recovery after COVID-19, we should first develop new and practical set of health and safety guidelines, which are applicable and valid in broader circumstances, such as COVID-19 and similar situations. And second, revise, and contra uh, revise the contracting approaches to improve the safety and efficiency of the workers. Also, force majeure and details of its condition should be part of each contract to avoid uh, complicated situations after events like COVID-19. Third, develop and invest on user-friendly online platforms that support direct and confidential communication between all of the involved parties. This can help to significantly improve and accelerate the decision-making process. And lastly, invest on recruiting and training new employees and talents for post-pandemic so we can increase the pace of recovery for future projects. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm done. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, and now gives me uh, the pleasure to um, just quickly go through the presentation of my colleagues, Jeff Casella, Will Towns, and Adam Frazier, uh, looking at reevaluating public transportation in a post-pandemic world under this infrastructure theme. And just as a starting point, again, we've heard many speakers today talk about um, sort of the situation pre-COVID versus post-COVID and the continuation of trends and, and key priorities uh, from pre-COVID that we're seeing today. So, you know, why public transit in the first place? Well, there's many great reasons, right, in terms of uh, its impact on the environment, in terms of its connection with our directions, in terms of more sustainable urban form. From an equity standpoint, the fact that it provides mobility, key mobility uh, across the spectrum of, of citizens in our communities. Um, 
and it very much is a complement to our interest and in efforts to try and increase active transportation in terms of cycling and walking, for example. So, you know, every transit trip is linked with some physical active transportation. And these were key goals before uh, COVID uh, impacted us and, and they will remain key goals in terms of our motivations for investing in public transit. Next slide, please. In terms of the, the impacts on public transit systems, um, just as in the case in terms of, you know, when we look at automobile activity and, and congestion levels, uh, once the, the lockdown was initiated, uh, public transit saw significant declines in ridership, uh, obviously in terms of uh, people's activities, but even now with uh, increasing requirements to maintain physical distancing and, and requirements um, from a healthcare perspective, have certainly increased the cost uh, for providing public transit and obviously impacted uh, the ability of systems to um, recoup their, or sorry, to gain revenues uh, that are so badly needed. So that whole balance of providing uh, mobility and weighing the cost and um, the revenues that come in from the fare box are being significantly impacted uh, as a result of the um, changes wrought by uh, the situation with COVID. Um, so higher operating costs per vehicle kilometer, greatly reduced revenue uh, per vehicle kilometer. And uh, that's something that certainly in the short term is going to require significant attention by, um, by policymakers and decision makers in our municipalities. Um, so, you know, what are some of the options? Uh, potentially exploring new revenue sources uh, would certainly be one of them. Next slide, please. In terms of what's going to happen um, once we return to a normal, whatever that normal looks like in, in the post-COVID realm, um, there certainly is a diversity of responses depending on where we are in terms of the, uh, the hierarchy of, of communities from metropolitan to mid-size to local communities. And the expectation is that, you know, if we're thinking of major cities like the GTA, Vancouver, Montreal, that um, their transit systems are so hardwired into the urban fabric that, uh, and the decisions that people have made about work life, uh, location, and balance, that they will see a return to uh, pre, -pandemic, pre pandemic levels just purely out of necessity. Um, in mid sized cities, obviously, uh, the work has shown that it may take longer to return to those uh, pre pandemic ridership levels, uh, again, because there are other transportation choices that are available. And in small cities where, uh, you know, quite often the, the transit system doesn't exist as part of the, the transit department, but as part of social services, because again, it is such an essential part of the community fabric. Uh, those are the communities where we would likely anticipate to see the exceptional challenges in terms of the viability of their transit systems. Um, now, in, in the case of the region of Waterloo, certainly given um, the launch of, of ION last year, um, the argument is that it's particularly vulnerable because we had a lot of momentum in terms of transforming people's behavior. And the key thing being the transformations that we're seeing in land use as well. Uh, so again, it's not the sort of short-term temporary, how am I gonna make that choice today? But in making significant location decisions, individuals are, are hardwiring their, um, their choice of transit and in fact, their reliance on transit. Next slide, please. So in, in terms of uh, recommendations coming out of this work about uh, the post pandemic and the future sort of long-term view, uh, very much, you know, the region should be committed to the supply that is provided an appropriate supply of transit services. And yeah, it's going to be costly, but uh, it is key, uh, part of our social fabric and part of our community. Um, explore new revenue sources for sure, um, embrace new technologies. And I know the region has run a number of pilots, uh, GRT in recent years on that front, um, but uh, dynamic supply options, on-demand transit options as well are something to be explored. Um, and certainly, again, uh, investments in uh, bike infrastructure, active transportation infrastructure would be critical at this point uh, rather than, or, or as, as, as a means of trying to prevent uh, increasing auto dependency at this time. Um, and again, monitor best practices throughout the industry. Um, 
is, is another obvious recommendation at this point. So yes, significant impacts in public transit realm, but um, I think certainly the argument would be that, um, you know, unlike the case in some cities where there uh, were explorations of shutting down the system, um, significantly scaling it back, um, that would not be uh, uh, the recommendation obviously at this point in time. So thank you. So in terms of moving now to the, um, we've got a few minutes left here to, um, to get into a Q&A session uh, on our theme of infrastructure. Um, so I will now transition from presenter to moderator of questions. Um, and a first question going back to our earlier discussion exploring uh, wastewater and if we could link to um, changes in terms of activity and, and where people are spending more of their time, i.e. not in the workplace, not in schools, but at home, um, has there been that sort of um, noticeable sort of spatial variation in terms of wastewater flows as a result of this uh, change in our activity spaces? The, the evidence that we have so far hasn't suggested that the net, that there's been a net uh, significant change in, in, in wastewater generation in the region. Um, however, um, you know, to, to break it down, we don't often have the data in a really distributed manner. We tend to only have it at the treatment plants. So it's, it's challenging to, to be able to actually go back and attribute to specific sources. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I guess, Wayne, for you as well, there's a question about, uh, you talked about, um, I think it was a, a reference to people cooking from home and you know, discharging more things like fat uh, down the sink, which is uh, not a great idea. Um, so, you know, how, how do we sort of encourage um, people to adopt more appropriate practices um, on issues like that? So I, I, th I think the, uh, the question actually talks about these, these, the formation of these things called fatbergs, which are really this amalgamation of fats and greases along with other kinds of materials that uh, sometimes are marketed as being flushables, but are really not very uh, appropriate to be flushed into the sewer system. And they all get trapped together to create this congealed mass. Uh, I think the, the, the real solutions to that are, are public messaging and public communications in terms of appropriate uh, management of these materials in the home. And also to make trying to make sure that our diversion strategies are really uh, targeting and you know being as effective as possible in terms of getting you know say fats and greases into a, a green bin stream rather than into a wastewater stream. So so really I think it's more about trying to ensure proper um, uh, use of diversion strategies and, and encouraging the populace to do that. Um, there's a question that they're related to um, use of water fountains and, and people, you know, traditionally using water fountains as, as part of refilling in their, uh, their daily activity. Um, and the question, I guess, is, is consideration be given to making water fountains COVID compliant? Uh, yeah, so two considerations are needed for the water font, uh, fountains. The more obvious one is that they could easily become a highly touched surface. So uh, there is a need for having a sanitization station, disinfection station right next to it and information for people to disinfect their hands before using the fountain. And uh, the less obvious consideration is that if the fountain is uh, placed in a location that is not used as much as it used to be used, so the water is sitting stagnant there and it goes back to the point I raised in my presentation that water that has been sitting stagnant in, uh, in pipes or fountains here could uh, might not be safe for drinking. So, uh, there needs to be uh, either a routine flushing uh, procedure for the water fountains, or there might be an automatic water cycling program already uh, installed for them. So like uh, we do want public to know that tap water is absolutely safe for consumption uh, and like bottled water is not the solution, but for uh, water fountains, these two uh, issues should be considered. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's a question then I get about building trust back into uh, public transit systems to reattract ridership or, or to, I guess, get back those riders. And it's a great question. I mean, again, I wasn't one of the researchers involved, but certainly, um, you know, I guess essential in, in giving people the confidence um, is addressing safety concerns and health concerns and ensuring that the proper protocols are in place and communicated as well, I think, uh, would be essential. Um, to try and uh, get that back as well. And again, it's interesting also to consider the motivations for people. Again, not everyone um, will uh, return to transit, not, you know, those decisions might be taken more of a longer term view, uh, as I mentioned about where people choose to live and their opportunities in terms of work. And as other presenters have already addressed today, that whole notion of, of where the work location is, um, is changing. So it'll be, uh, interesting to see how that plays out in terms of commuting activity, but also in terms of discretionary travel activity, uh, which there's not a lot of currently, but uh, but when we get to that return. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, taking a crack at getting back on track time-wise, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, presenting in the infrastructure section and again remind people that the presentations the white papers will be available through the region um, and the questions are being um, shared with the researchers and with the region as well um, and so now I'm, I'm putting my colleagues on the spot and getting them to um, to get ready a little bit in advance given <laughs> that it's 222 and 23 seconds how's that for timing um, so without further ado we're going to switch into the density and housing theme the afternoon um, and our first presentation dealing with urban density. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, my colleague, Professor Marcus Mose. Marcus. Thanks, Clarence. Uh, and uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you for joining us uh, today. I'm Marcus Mose. I'm with the School of Planning. Um, this project um, was completed by uh, Tara Vina dry who's a professor at University of Toronto and you've heard from her earlier today uh, but most of the background work um, for this um, was done by a research assistant and grad student in the School of Planning Amanda McCulley um, so many thanks to her for all her efforts uh, on, on this front. Um, for the rest of uh, the, the, this brief presentation, I want to talk about the link between population density and the spread of COVID. And when I talk about population density, um, I'm really referring to sort of the number of people per area at the neighborhood level, at the, you know, the building level, at, the, at the, that larger scale, not so much how many people are living within one unit, although we will get to that as well. Um, our understanding of things, of course, is still evolving, but I think in a nutshell, from the discussions and evidence to date, um, population density on its own is really not as much of the culprit um, of COVID spread as it was first thought. The relationship um, between COVID spread and um, density is not as directly causal, I think, as was first suggested by some observers. Um, there are instances where density does coincide with increased COVID incidence uh, and spread, and that seems to be when there's overcrowding within the unit. That is, there are more occupants within a particular housing unit, an apartment or a house, uh, than would be sort of deemed, um, you know, uh, acceptable and, and uh, sort of with having the sufficient number of bedrooms and bathrooms to accommodate that household size. So overcrowding within the units seems to play a role. But also, of course, during the pandemics, um, in particular during the lockdown, we saw issues with uh, density in terms of um, those denser um, environments where there was not necessarily surrounding or nearby open space. Um, so in some ways, the situation basically amplifies something planners have been, you know, talking about and been researching for a long time. And that's sort of twofold. The first one is really about an increase in density only really works if you connect it with appropriate open space. So it's going to courtyards, rooftops, gardens, balconies, surrounding parks, and so forth. Second, an increase in density um, is really also an issue when it's connected with affordability concerns, because that's when it starts leading to overcrowding. 
Um, and this is particularly a concern for lower income groups, uh, particularly visible minorities, refugees, recent immigrants would be uh, overrepresented in that population, which is also a population we know from the labor um, side of things that is overrepresented in service sector and retail jobs, where also the risk to exposure to COVID uh, would be higher than if you're, you know, like me now sitting in the basement of my house. Um, so that's sort of the overall um, message. And so let's look into it um, a, a little bit deeper piece by piece. So uh, on, on what you're seeing on the slide now is, uh, you know, it's a screenshot from a social media account from the governor of New York, who in the early days of the, of the pandemic was quite concerned about density levels in New York City, in this, in this case being, um, you know, he argues uh, or suggests destructive. Now, what we've started finding in our analysis, including this particular you know, tweet, um, much of what was said in the early days was, of course, based on speculation, not evidence, um, and on people's experiences during the initial lockdown, which is, of course, not how will things continue to unfold over, over many years. In the next slide, you can see a picture of our um, of our uptown in Waterloo here, where of course the um, uh, local context is very different, as we um, can see on the on the next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, so people saw spaces like this. I took this, you know, sort of at the height of the of the lockdown, and it looked empty, so to speak. And I think naturally. Um, people started to worry about the future of these type of spaces when people, uh, you know, didn't congregate there anymore, given all the work uh, that has gone into the planning and development and building of these um, public gathering spaces. Um, now, as we'll see on the next slide, that, you know, the worries, or as I'll argue, I'll talk about on this next slide, is that our worries, of course, don't make for good evidence for the most Part, right? And so we wanted to look beyond our sort of just initial worries and concerns about the future of, of sort of the higher density uh, parts of our, of our region and look more closely at the evidence that is being used uh, within the media uh, to support arguments about how higher and lower density uh, may or may not be problematic within the context of COVID. And so what we did in this context is we, we looked at the media, we looked at what um, arguments were being made within it and what was being provided to support as a supporting evidence. In some cases, there were academic studies. Of course, many of them are still being developed, but there were some uh, early on. Um, and in other cases, we just looked sort of at the quality of, of the argument. Um, as you can see on the, on the next slide then, what we um, arrived at from that analysis is really found three overarching themes of how um, arguments around the relationship between density and COVID were playing out. Um, there were those who were pointing specifically to historic trends, right? And the argument there is that, well, even you know, back to industrialization, there were planning concepts like the Garden City movement and even just generally suburbanization um, being a response to issues uh, and sometimes health issues, sometimes other kinds of issues, like in the case of 9-11, for instance, where it is a more a national security uh, and terror threat, um, that there were historic incidences where people argued that they were wanting to leave large cities um, because of health, health concerns. And so the argument is that, that we might see that same uh, response again today. The other argument against density is, has to do with the global cities. So, you know, much of the spread initially was first visible, uh, it would seem, um, in, in large global cities. And so because of that initial growth, I think there was what we might just call an intuitive link where people sort of saw, well, it's the big cities where it's happening, it must be because they're dense. Um, and that because we're assuming that that's where most social contact uh, occurs uh, among the population. Finally, the arguments um, you know, sort of against density also pointed to things surrounding urban flight, which has a lot more to do with our work locations and availability of own space. Um, it's assumed that, you know, the more people work from home, that um, they might disperse out of the city into to the countryside or into smaller towns uh, because you're no longer as tied to a particular connection, uh, location um, because of your commute not being as regular. Also, sometimes, especially in much larger cities um, than our own, but there are um, concerns around open space. And so the argument is, you know, does this working from home now give people an opportunity to access more open space by relocating?
So that's the one side of the arguments. The other side, as we see on the next slide, is arguments in favor of density actually revolved around the very same themes in many cases, but the reasoning provided was different, right? And so then those who explored the historic trends of how cities were impacted um, by, you know, by health emergencies and other kinds of situations found, well, that actually in many cases, and 9-11 is, you know, arguably perhaps the most recent example, um, is that there were very many speculations in the early days about it being sort of the end of large cities, the end of, of, of financial districts, because cities, you know, as sort of this agglomeration of, of economic activity being in some sense sort of a, uh, you know, potentially a, a security threat. Now, much of that discussion faded away over the years and cities returned, and many would probably argue uh, more substantially and even stronger than, than before many of the historic, whether it's pandemic or security, security incidences that pose doubt uh, on people's mind as to whether cities would come around. Um, with the global cities, it's the same um, it's the same kind of question, right? It's um, it, the argument there is that actually rather than it being the density of these cities in and of themselves, that it's the global connectivity of people moving in and out that is contributing to the potential for greater spread. Um, but also that economic growth um, you know, is occurring in, in global cities and is partly a function of that density. Finally, with urban flight, you know, there's the argument that while many actually are returning to a quote unquote work now, their former location, as we heard from earlier presentations, many can't work from home. Some people were being told that there actually would be salary cuts if they moved from you know, urban regions to smaller places, uh, which might be a disincentive to leave the larger cities. And then finally, you know, amenities um, are actually just as important for many people for being uh, um, uh, close to the um, uh, to, to urban life. And so overall, I think where we, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, arrive at with this work is that yes, density plays a role, but it's primarily plays out through overcrowding and that's partly an affordability problem. So in, in moving forward and in terms of what this means for our planning process, I think generally we would uh, argue that when you do density, uh, it needs to, I think we've always known this, but I think uh, this pandemic has highlighted it even more than, um, than before, is that that density um, needs to be connected to um, open space immediately within the building, whether it's balconies or, or you know, uh, terraces, rooftop gardens, um, and surrounding uh, open space. Uh, but also that density without amenity, so if we build compact urban cores that don't have uh, uh, things other than jobs, we may actually see that decline because there's likely going to be more home-based work than there was uh, prior, even if it doesn't you know, stay at the same level as today. So overall, I think the good news is that I think from an environmental perspective, from a you know, sustainability perspective, uh, it's long been known that it makes sense to try and grow up as opposed to out, so to speak. Um, and even though the COVID pandemic is highlighting some challenges, um, that those can be addressed while you still pursue a densification objective. Uh, but particularly important is, again, the emphasis on providing uh, open space and on ensuring affordability and appropriate housing for much of our vulnerable community members so that we can prevent overcrowding. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much for your um, attention. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marcus. Um, we'll now move to the second presentation uh, in this theme, um, dealing with the 15-minute city. Okay, so this report has been prepared by Niluka Lianaj and myself. Uh, Niluka is a doctoral candidate at the School of Planning, nearly done, nearly about to graduate. And she, is all, she also works as a consultant specializing in smart growth, public health, and, uh, and, and also on active transportation. Um, incidentally, two years ago, we together authored a report on walkability in urban growth centers for the uh, growth secretariat. So our argument is the following one, is that if public transit is not able to perform as it used to, and if public transit 
was the main vector, the main catalyst for intensification, what can we do instead? Density is a meal that doesn't go well on its own. Uh, it's, it's not very appetizing on its own. It needs to have sa sauces in order to highlight, to highlight it. And one of those sauces is public transit. Um, and we can see that, and especially through the TAR, transit-oriented development model, that density is generally associated with public transit and they both, both complement each other. The problem though, is that with the pandemic, the tr public transit sauce is not as thick as it used to be and it's not as tasty as it used to be. So it's not as effective as it used to be in order to highlight or to serve as a catalyst for density. And we don't know when, and we don't know how public transit is going to come back. Um, I mean, Jeff discussed that, Jeff Casello discussed that in his uh, presentation. We can be optimistic, we can be pessimistic, but it remains at the moment, public transit operates at about 25% of its usual capacity. And in many cases, services are being cut. So what we propose, instead is that if public transit cannot be relied upon to serve as a means to advance density, what can we do instead? And this is a very important question in the context of Waterloo Region because Waterloo Region has put a lot of emphasis on intensification and has used public transit as a way to promote intensification. So what we propose instead is uh, creating a 15 minute walking neighborhood that attracts activities where it is possible. And, and that would essentially combine th those different features. It would combine density, it would combine walkability, and it would combine a concentration of activities. Next slide, and Luca, it's your turn. Yes, thanks, Pierre. And also the COVID pandemic brought renewed interest and visions for sustainable cities that you know, having ample public spaces where safe walking and cycling can flourish. And not just because the, the confidence in public transit could take years to bounce back in places like Waterloo Region, but also to reclaim streets for people as a resilient way forward for, for cities and healthy living. So, and, you know, we've all seen around the world that some places are accelerating those active transportation investments and making those temporary space accommodations permanent. So the 15 minute city really, it's, it's inspired by Jane Jacobs, the human centered approach to planning of that mix of amenities and the close proximity. And the good thing is it also shares similarities with the neighborhood unit about laying out everyday functions within these short walking distances. And transit oriented development, you know, here in Waterloo, it already plans and designs using this spatial temporal dimension uh, as short as 400 meters or a five minute walk to stations and stops. And there's really good evidence that actually the median walking distances are much longer to transit, like double, and distance destination walking is actually upwards of two kilometers. So it's quite feasible to stretch Todd. Um, so we see the 15 minute city as reconciling the intensification and the COVID concerns because it is grounded in walking outdoors at this smaller scale. And this means 24 seven access to fresher air that we know has lower risk of viral transmission than indoors and including in transit vehicles and stations. Um, there's multiple benefits as well. It provides alternative mobility to essential workers, the vulnerable people, or those in lower income and non-driving groups, especially when transit service might have to be reduced. It protects transit drivers from exposure, whether mobility, uh, when other mobility options are also viable. And there's so many synergies with the public health and the planning objectives, which are very much aligned, we see, with Waterloo Region's official plan and the local municipal direction. So obviously walking supports the physical and mental health. We know it reduces the automobile ownership and trips. So that reduces the demand and the cost for road expansion. We know that planning and designing for non-motorized users improves road safety overall and humanizes our streets. 
It does expand equity and access to essential services for a greater number of people. And like many of the panelists have said, working from home, um, there are more people doing this, but it also has them recreating in their neighborhoods. So the 15 minute city actually can provide some of that needed public realm facilities that are so critical for high density dwellers with limited interior space. And this really opens up opportunities for developing residential density inside neighborhoods and strengthening those lo hyperlocal activities. So walking and cycling also supports transit recovery. These really are also transit riders. And once the private vehicles are bought, it really will be harder to convert back to transit. That is so important for Waterloo Region's growth. Orienting to pedestrians also addresses accessibility and upcoming uh, curb and sidewalk management objectives. Um, next slide, please. So just to contrast Todd with pedestrian oriented development a bit, you know, clearly there's a distance and time ranges of transit are larger, but both, both move the greatest number of people. And POD does service smaller areas like at the neighborhood scale, but it builds the ridership now and for the long term. And of course, the investments are quite dramatically different between the two, but POD can be planned and implemented faster, just as we see here across Waterloo Region with temporary facilities. And this supports the modal shifts underway that we want. And Todd supports the high density commercial residential employment mix, but with POD, we expect a staggered density approach to be achievable within a larger, say, 30 minute walking range, and with a focus on some of those missing middle options alongside a more creative and flexible commercial residential uh, mix. And the other thing is that when we see that Todd suffers from a lack of activity, sometimes in downtowns, like in the evenings and on weekends, the 15 minute city has this benefit if that people are in their neighborhoods, you know, hyper local activities, more of these can be encouraged. Um, also with fewer safe indoor activities available, the all season public realm facilities and programs need to be planned for. And we can draw from winter city ideas like we see in Europe as we head toward the cold and flu season. Um, next slide. So we see several opportunities to adapt intensification hubs along the central transit corridor to the 15 minute city. So some of our recommendations first, is Todd can be stretched to 30 minute walking distances. And that can mean incenting the missing, missing middle residential density inside neighborhoods and also with larger and flexible units. We also think there's an opportunity to get creative, allowing at grade commercial and office spaces to have maker spaces, pop-ups and even residential. And with, there's been a growth in delivery alongside the declines in the brick and mortar retail. So we think that you can focus on hyper-local activities and consider things like STOAs, you know, for year round engagement around shops and neighborhoods. Um, second, the public realm has to be safe and comfortable even in the winter. So we think animation and place branding strategies that welcome people yet limit large gatherings would be a good idea leveraging existing programs like Love My Hood, Active and Safe Routes to School. These are designed to improve those neighborhood connections and safe travel. And, and again, especially focus on those colder and wetter periods to get people outside at those times. And third, prioritize walking and cycling year round. And this might mean, you know, slow, changing sidewalk snow clearing practices done by governments, for example, and not residents. Um, that obviously supports pandemic health if people get out year round, the modal shifts, and then the faster return to transit. Prioritizing corridors and services for essential workers, the vulnerable, and really complete those missing links in the non-motorized network. And in the face of criticism, we've seen some of that in the media, um, you know, strategically making those walking and cycling investments um, permanent ahead of a likely automobile rebound and to coordinate that with the transit service. And lastly, ongoing adaptation we see requires flexibility and nimble responses by cities and regions. So efforts like the Central Transit Corridor Monitoring Program, it's a great place to start and coupled with sort of shorter frequent surveys to gather evidence that will be used to support making these ongoing health, land use, transportation and program adaptations going forward. Um, and Pierre's got a few closing remarks. 
So if transit becomes less effective as a way to promote density, well, maybe a pleasant pedestrian hospitable environment with a lot of activities, with a lot of animation, all of this taking place at the neighborhood scale would become a way of selling, of making density appealing. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you both. Uh, we'll move on to the third presentation in this section on housing and that's housing and implications in Waterloo Region. Hello, Clarence. Yes, go ahead, Justin. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me just um, get organized here. Okay, thanks, Clarence. Hello, everyone. I'm Justin van der Merwe, an MA student in the School of Planning, and it's my privilege to present the work of Brian Desay, professor in the same school, Marcus Mose, and myself. So during lockdown, many of us have had to work out how to use our living rooms as offices, uh, gyms, classrooms, often in the same day and even sometimes at the same time. So we all know that housing and the notion of home are in a state of flux in the region due to COVID. But there are various supply side interventions that government can take uh, that could help residents to adapt. And this relates both to non-market and market housing. So we found that the key areas to focus on are intra-provincial migration and especially out migration from the GTA. I'm sure that we've all been following the CTV coverage of the skyrocketing house prices in the region with one offer coming in as much as high as $186,000 over the asking price. Um, although this may be good for those who are trying to turn a profit on their property, we should, of course, also consider those who can't afford a home at all. So ensuring access to affordable housing is also important, and especially for vulnerable populations. Lastly, we also need to deconstruct the changes in housing demand due to COVID and aim to meet these needs within the existing urban footprint. We also acknowledge that the trends that we are observing are not new, but similar to what Tara and, and Marcus have already said, that the pandemic has effectively amplified and accelerated the existing needs and housing crises in the region. Uh, next slide, please. So regarding the monitoring of intra-provincial migration, the first point is that although there are no or few conclusive studies in this matter, there is anecdotal evidence to suggest the pandemic has increased housing demand in the Waterloo region and that the pandemic has effectively accelerated the trend of out migration from the GTA. For example, Colleen Kohler, president of the KW Association of Realtors, recently suggested that upwards of 50% of agents showing properties to clients in the Waterloo region in July were actually GTA agents. Also, a recent survey by the Ontario Real Estate Association suggests that since the pandemic, interest in rural and suburban living has risen with buyers looking for more outdoor and indoor space. Of course, this follows the general trend of working remotely, which allows people the option of living further away from work with commuting times being less of a factor. The virus has then in many senses amplified the classical uh, uh, 
GTA push factors such as uh, small and expensive properties, dense living arrangements with long commutes, and also strengthen the relative push pull factors rather from uh, from the water uh, from the side of the water, of Waterloo region. Uh, for example, it's relative affordability, more space, and strong and diverse economy. Of course, the likelihood of a move from GTA to Waterloo region is also supported by studies and StatCan data that demonstrate that Canada's gateway cities, such as Toronto, grow mostly because of um, immigrants coming into the country, whereas mid-sized urban areas such as Waterloo region see most of their net population growth due to intra-provincial migration. However, this in migration is not indiscriminate as we're also seeing increased discernment regarding the type and quality of housing. Larger homes, which can accommodate home offices and have extra space for children, for example, are particularly sought after. In July, year-on-year -year sales for single detached housing in KW rose by about 25% with average sales price, with the average sales price of a single detached home being $745,000, up to around 21% 20, compared to July in the previous year. Townhouses and apartment style condos are also doing well, but saw slightly less, less growth. However, this is also happening at a time when inventory is low. It's about 28% 20, less than it was in July a year ago. So this limited supply at a time when demand is rising is clearly pushing up the prices. So the point to stress is that COVID is clearly not the great equalizer and that those who already lived in desirable housing have access to financing um, and are allowed to work from home are actually benefiting from the pandemic in many ways. Whereas those who cannot get access to financing are restricted to public commutes and whose jobs require them to be on site are largely unable to benefit from the pandemic. There are also several uncertainties linked to the fluctuations in the market and that it is generally too early to tell what the overall outcomes of the pandemic on the housing market are likely to be. There's various trends to observe for the, in the interest of time. I'm, I'm not going to get into, into them all of, all of them at the moment. Um, next slide, please. So although some of us may be excited about the influx of capital into the region, we must, of course, understand that this can't be at the expense of current residents and getting the housing mix right in terms of the community's needs. COVID-related downward economic pressure is likely to have what you could call a, a downgrading in the housing market generally, which will have a negative impact on most, but also present opportunities for some. For example, diminished income would obviously have an uh, impact on tenants and land landlords, um, but there's also been a collapse of the Air, of Airbnb or the short-term rental markets due to COVID, while the rates, the real estate investment trusts may see opportunities in terms of buying up properties cheaply, which would also have mixed effects on affordability. So the homeless crisis has also obviously come to the fore during the pandemic. A common theme in the media coverage of the pandemic is how COVID effectively exposed the cracks in our society and created moments for self-reflection. The subtext was that the current interventions to assist the homeless should actually not be seen as band-aid interventions, um, or, e or even particularly radical for that matter, but perhaps become the norm. Finding, of course, long-term solutions is important in light of a uh, possible second or third wave of the pandemic, and even, who knows, perhaps even a new pandemic in the future. However, few studies have actually investigated the effects of the pandemic on housing and vulnerable populations. But there is an anecdotal evidence to suggest that, um, the, the, or rather to support the housing of housing first approach. For example, some people who were temporarily housed in the Radisson during the pandemic felt that their dignity had been restored and that they had been given a chance to overcome addictions or that they'd seen a general increase in their health, for example. Um, the last point effectively relates to how political pressures and the releasing of finances due to COVID possibly presents an opportunity to develop publicly owned land for affordable housing and shelter purposes. Next slide, please. So the last point really relates to accurately understanding the shifts in housing demand due to COVID and especially the need for more space. So this final point is perhaps 
most easily understood by breaking it up into a context challenge and then outlining the approach. So the context I've largely provided already in the sense that COVID has changed the way people view their home. Home's now a space for work, recreational purposes, um, and even educational purpose, and that more space is required. Of course, the challenge then is how does one sort of replicate the elements that people like, such a, that are normally synonymous with single detached housing, such as um, increased indoor and outdoor space, access to green spaces and trails, but in a way that doesn't contribute to the, the related uh, negative aspects, such as further sprawl and further encroachment on green spaces. The approach uh, is effectively then to place a greater emphasis on the design of individual units as well as larger developments. Um, for example, aside from government um, approving the number of uni units, a government could take greater ownership of design elements that seek to replicate some of these desirable elements. Um, this would also, of course, entice people back to the urban cause as opposed to being pushed away or out further out into the urban fringes of the city. Achieving these objectives then is also compatible with broader goals of sustainability and reducing automobile dependency. Next slide. So in the interest of time, just to conclude briefly, I, I would like to reiterate the value of monitoring intra-provincial migration flows, ensuring the provision of affordable housing and of taking a proactive approach to design. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Clarence. Thank you so much, Justin, appreciate it. All right, we now are in the question and answer uh, section for this particular group on, on housing and density, fascinating exploration. Um, one of the questions that I, I see and would like to direct back to, uh, to Marcus relates to, um, I guess, the, the spectrum of density and, and is there a difference between sort of, or do cities that have sort of a broader spectrum of density fare better um, during COVID than cities that tend to have like the hyper density of a Shanghai or, or a Paris? It's a good question. I think um, we don't quite know enough how the mix of density um, plays out. Um, although I think it is, is notable that many of the initial assessments, uh, even of the summer, what we might call hyper dense places um, that process and um, restrictions that were in place and sort of social convention played as large a role as the built environment in and of itself. Itself, right. So in places where, um, particularly the role of where government was quite proactive in terms of uh, responding, putting restrictions in place, uh, people wearing masks and all those kind of things, um, it is often argued played, uh, played a larger role. Um, I think the big factor to consider sort of in this mix of housing types is that I think, um, you know, it, it really depends on the context of the city, right? And so I think in, in our region, it's made increasing sense for various reasons to, to, um, to build um, increasingly um, higher um, um, apartment buildings, for instance, um, but also at the same time recognizing that um, in terms of our overall housing mix that's actually still um, you know a smaller part of our overall housing stock in, in the region and that there is room to develop um, you know sort of a mix of housing types across the spectrum um, in the mid-rise uh, sector in particular I think. And, and just uh, staying with you for a second Marcus and another question that was uh, in the Q&A area relates to the notion of uh, if you consider the region and our, our core areas and the amount of parkland that's there, what's your perspective on sort of the ability to sort of balance the density we're seeing and, and density that's coming um, with that, that green space? I mean, is there enough um, or, you know, do we have enough to offset that increasing density in terms of the, that green space amenity that you identify as being so important? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. I think we, I I don't I can't answer it specifically because the you know the cities uh, and the region potentially as well would do would be doing assessments that relate uh, the park space availability to the new growth. And so there are specific 
um, you know, calculations and assessments that our local governments are already following to try and ensure um, that we have, you know, what we might consider adequate park space. Now, of course, an event like this makes us maybe as a society sort of reconsider, well, what is adequate park space, right? And so I think what I'm sort of urging is not necessarily um, uh, on the one hand, yeah, one, one, I'm not necessarily saying there's not enough, but I think it requires a reassessment of what it means to have enough space. Uh, and the second point would be to say, I think one of the areas that um, we in the region here could probably benefit from is actually actually some of the smaller park spaces that are more interspersed within the living environment. So we have um, quite a few larger spaces, um, but sometimes, um, you know, sort of having uh, even smaller green spaces immediately within our uh, downtowns or, or nodes, I think is something that uh, I personally would pay uh, more attention to. All right, thank you. Um, getting to the, the question of the 15 minute city idea, um, interesting question that's come forward is in terms of uh, the suburbs and, and thinking of our traditional suburban structures, um, can that idea of the 15 and the, and the characteristics of the 15 minute city work in the traditional suburb area as well? Has that been uh, promoted at all or, or thought about in terms of what you've seen in your work? It's interesting that uh, this concept was first put forward in the context of, of Paris, which has extremely high density. So you can create 15 minute cities pretty much everywhere in a place like Paris. It's just a matter of relocating activities because the density threshold is there to support this kind of configuration. And the context of Waterloo region, it would have to be in high density hubs. It would have to be created within the Waterloo environment because the suburban density cannot support that. Although one could argue, you know, the downtown Kitchener, uptown Waterloo are 15 minute cities. Uh, Belmont Village is a bit of a 15 minute city as well, where you have a mixture of uh, housing types and a mixture of activities blended with that you are able to create the 15 minute city. And a point that is interesting as well is that the creation of 15 minute cities when it is pedestrian based is more flexible than transit oriented development because you don't need, you're not as reliant on public transit infrastructure. So you can create them in more places than you can in the case of transit oriented development. And Niluka, do you have something to add to that? Um, just was one of the other questions uh, came about was looking at like say Williamsburg that that neighborhood and that's good, a good example I think so that's a that's a neighborhood outside of the core area in Waterloo region and it's it has sort of a smaller compact form in part of it it's got a cluster of um, uh, shopping uh, amenities around it and other services and then it has some townhouses um, immediately around it but it then it sort of spreads out into more uh, um, detached homes but there's an example where you could build upon uh, that kind of planned community I think and start to offer more of those amenities and start to increase some of the density if there was some some land available and I think there there are some ongoing um, developments uh, around there that well increase density so I think there's a good opportunity in some of those locations to, to kind of create that 15 minute city. And in the case of Williamsburg, you would need to improve the pedestrian environment as well. Absolutely, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I guess a, a question for, uh, for Justin related to, um, you suggested sort of the GTA activity flowing into the Waterloo region and, and the focus on monitoring interprovincial migration. Um, you know, have you got recommendations on what's the best way, like in terms of the, the data sources for that? That's a bit tricky um, to try and, and follow, is it not? Uh, yeah, I would imagine. Um, well, the, the, the source of the, the anecdotal evidence that I pointed to was um, the, the agents looking at um, the, the um, GTA agents showing clients property in the Waterloo region. Um, so, so actual uh, real estate data that one needs to to go to. Um, they, I'm not sure they always track who who the, the address the person has come from, but um, there are there are ways of doing that through real estate data. Um, 
the other one, the other interesting angle is to, to take more of a comparative approach. We say um, regions uh, on the outer edge or outside of the golden, the greater golden horseshoe uh, have common factors and then also look at, look at sort of trends comparatively across regions. Yeah, and, it, and certainly the, the notion of, um, you know, where people are choosing to live vis-a-vis -vis the opportunities in the housing market looks, sorry, in the employment market looks very different, tying it back to where we started this afternoon, you know, exploring the notion, the notion of work um, is now uh, a very different consideration as well. So, you know, uh, it's not just about the region, but it's obviously about the, the proximal regions as well and, and what's going on in terms of their economy. That's an important consideration. That's right. Absolutely. Is there time to quickly jump in there, Clarence? Yeah, please go ahead, Marcus. Um, no, that, I, I agree with what's been said. And I think the other thing that uh, we have to keep in mind in terms of that migration is that, um, you know, just recently um, there, there were numbers made available now and in terms of international migration. Of course, we, we know that international, uh, so immigration into, into Canada is part of the big driver of the large city housing markets, particularly the GTA in, in Ontario. And so with the slowdown, down, um, of immigration into the GTA, um, you know, depending on how long they persist, you might also see a bit of a softening of the housing market in the GTA, which then maybe, you know, sort of slows down a bit of that spillover effect into surrounding regions. So it's one of these things um, that has a lot of variables at play, and that's really difficult to predict ahead of time, but it's one that I think we need to keep our eye on. Um, but in, you know, in addition to looking at the in the local migration, we could use immigration as a sign as to, well, what are the pressures on the GTA market? And if that pressure is fairly strong, you know, is it likely to spill over into our area? Thank you, Marcus. Um, I, you know, trying to capture some of the, the questions that are in the, the forum as well. I just broadly, I'll, I'll open it up to all the presenters in this section. Um, what are your thoughts around, uh, you know, before um, COVID, housing affordability was a central issue. Um, how do you now see that discussion and the efforts underway in terms of policy responses in particular to address housing affordability through the work that you've done? Uh, I can I can jump in there. Sure. Um, so the um, uh, in terms of housing affordability, I think some of the pressures that we'll see actually relate to the th some of the things we talked about, you know, the, while ago earlier when we started our symposium today about the changing economy and so if we have more and more people that are out of work or incomes aren't growing for some people it will of course affect um, housing demand so i think the expectation would be that we'd see greater affordability concerns but that those affordability concerns aren't not they're not going to be evenly distributed right there's going to be very uh, a polarizing effect in in, in many ways um, and so I think as, um, as in terms of a policy response, um, looking you know, at some of the figures we were shown earlier about uh, unemployment and the existence of a recession, I, um, you know, it would seem, uh, I think, that preparing for greater affordability need, whether it's through uh, income assistance or on the supply side would be something that I think policy um, would be would be needing to look to. I think one of the things we're probably fortunate um, on is that the uh, um, that the you know the federal government um, had been supplementing income for people in, that were out of work, which I think would have you know helped alleviate some of these affordability pressures. That's when people are out of work and they can't afford their rent or mortgages, you'd likely see some of those pressures um, amplified. So definite policy. Um, opening there, I think, at, at various levels of government. I, th I think there are three factors at work with respect to housing affordability at the moment. Um, one of it is people adjust their housing according to their needs. So, so, so there's the old issue, and that came out in Justin's paper. I mean, people moving to bigger houses, you know, go going for single family homes. And I don't see that, you know, it was interpreted in the paper as being you know, people benefiting from the pandemic. I don't think they're benefiting in any way from the pandemic. It is just that in their circumstances, this is their way of adjusting. You know, so they're leaving a place like in central Toronto where they had the smaller, a smaller house that was more expensive than what they're buying at the uh, periphery of the metropolitan region. So, so this is one factor. The other factor as well is that there would be um, housing crisis, a major housing uh, 
crisis due to poverty, essentially. People losing their jobs, not being able to afford their house anymore. So, you know, in these kind of circumstances, you know, if they're left to themselves, they become homeless or they have to go back, you know, as adults living with their parents or find some kind of arrangements of that nature. And, and I think there's a third factor at play, which is a bit related to the, to the first one I've mentioned, is the change of scale in the activities within metropolitan regions. Um, you know, the, the, the market that is the hottest at the moment is the market of cottages in the Muskokas, okay? People wanting to move out, you know, they see themselves as being able, not having to commute anymore. So then they want to go out and live in a country, have plenty of space. But the other side of this phenomenon is likely to be a much reduced demand for living in downtown areas. You know, if, if people can work from home, what's the point of living downtown areas? If a lot of people, is, if there's less people during the day, there'll be less activities in the downtown areas. So what's the point of paying a $2,500 rent, you know, a month to live in downtown Toronto when you've got only about half what existed there in terms of stores, in terms of activities, and, you're, and you don't need to go to your job anymore. So I think the price of that specific housing stock may well decline significantly in the future. And there would be much less construction, if not no construction at all, of new housing in the downtown areas. All right, we're going to leave it there for uh, this Q&A period. And, and thanks again to all three groups for their presentations. Uh, we're now going to move into the next theme, which is social and environmental implications of COVID in terms of the uh, future planning efforts in the region. Um, and I'll ask our first group to kick things off, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lindsay Noren, and I'm a second year master's student in urban planning at the University of Waterloo. On behalf of my team, I will be presenting our work on supporting community well being by reconsidering the role of public space in current and future pandemics. Uh, this work was completed by myself, Dr. Jennifer Dean, Dr. Troy Glover, as well as Mandy Tang. Next slide, please. So public space has long been a focus topic in regard to community health and well-being. Uh, historically, the rural countryside was viewed as an idyllic green space of healing, um, a space to really cure the ills of the polluted and congested city. Since antiquity, public squares have been used as sites of protest and democratic engagement. And in the mid 20th century, Jane Jacobs led calls to reclaim these urban streets and sidewalks to create vibrant and safe public spaces for pedestrians. More recently, we have focused on the role of parks and green spaces to support both individual and planetary health, as well as the importance of libraries and other social infrastructure to alleviate social isolation and build that strong sense of community. The public realm is often at times this taken for granted aspect of our communities. That is until it is no longer available. The impact of public space closures during the pandemic has received significant attention by planners, urban thinkers, the media, as well as advocacy groups. There has been no shortage of commentary about how COVID-19 has highlighted these gaps in the provision to the safe spaces for social and physical distancing. Um, this has only been magnified by recent global protests as COVID-19 is a real time example of how crucial safe and inclusive public spaces are for our most disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. So our report will be synthesizing the state of thinking on public space and community well-being in the current pandemic and highlight strategies to enhance public space for future health and well-being. Next slide, please. For this work, we have defined public space in accordance to the domains identified by the project for public spaces. So parks, downtown districts, streets and sidewalks, public markets, rural communities, civic buildings, and public squares. We have omitted waterfronts as they are not relevant to the Waterloo region. Uh, the concept of community well-being has multiple definitions as well. So because this work is for the region, we opted to use the Canadian Index of Well-Being and its eight identified domains. So healthy populations, time use, democratic engagement, environment, education, community vitality, living standards, and leisure and culture. To guide our thinking on public space and well-being, we've created this framework to identify how specific public spaces either directly or indirectly impact public space. For example, public squares affect community well-being through four key domains, as you can see on the visual here. 
We have overlaid this definition of public space with the well being domains in order to highlight the range of connections between place and health. Prior to COVID 19, we knew that public spaces were an important asset for communities, just how important they were for residents in general and vulnerable populations in particular was really brought to the forefront when the pandemic caused the closure of parks, playgrounds, civic buildings, public markets, and other public spaces, which remained virtually empty. Next slide. Our review of existing literature, recent policy changes, and pandemic-specific commentary resulted in five major concerns related to public space during COVID-19. These are accessibility and availability, adequacy, equity, economic recovery, and thus the permanence of these perspective solutions, which you will see in the coming slides. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to begin with availability and accessibility. So the pandemic illuminated this stark reality in many places of the imbalance between density and green space. Uh, this has led to the overcrowding of certain public spaces, making this physical distancing very difficult. Many cities were quite quick to adapt to this new overcrowding issue as New York City, for example, began painting circles in parks to maintain that six foot measure. Um, Toronto also adapted this strategy. Additionally, the city of Vancouver eliminated parking in parks to allow for that added room for people. But in many communities, there simply isn't enough public space for the population to safely use in this pandemic. Accordingly, communities have been reallocating space to be used by the public. And we want, like, it's like we want people to be physically distant, but social distance can create a myriad of issues to the individual health as well, including social isolation, so it is imperative that these public spaces are open and function safely for exactly that reason. Um, so cities really need to facilitate this balance in order for these spaces to be conducive to community well-being. And if this is not done, these spaces can actually work in reverse, putting the community at risk for disease transmission, specifically in this case. Moving to adequacy, many of our current streets right now cannot support physical distancing measures long lines and the increased use of active transportation during the pandemic um, has shown that cities really need to rethink the design and function of our streets as a measure of both physical activity but also breathing room with that necessary physical distance. A common response of many cities was to increase the amount of cycling lanes that they have within their city as well as closing some lanes and even streets to cars. Uh, this was prevalent in Waterloo region, yes. <laughs> Toronto and Montreal also did this. So, travel, so travelers can safely exist in the same space while maintaining that important distance. Across the border, Oakland has also implemented thousands of kilometers of quiet streets uh, with this goal in mind. Next slide. Something that's always been an issue within cities is ensuring the fair, equitable access to public goods. So this issue has really been magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has brought to the surface just how many inequities are actually faced by vulnerable populations in terms of accessing necessary public space as well as the ability to travel safely through these spaces. The city of Vancouver has introduced van play, which began as a master plan for parks and recreation that includes equity mapping, which will pinpoint vulnerable areas of the city where more space is needed. On this thought, a lot of the time cities focus on the equality aspect of public space planning and expect equitable outcomes in return. But the truth is that in some communities, they, some actually need more public space than others to reap the same benefits. Along with this strategy is adjusting community engagement overall to be more community and population specific. Um, improving the impacts of public space access for new immigrants, for example, would require attention to the diversity of ways in which newcomers use park spaces. Um, the time of day that they engage with these spaces, in addition to utilizing design strategies that would increase physical distancing within these spaces without being defensive and making these spaces in vulnerable areas more welcoming. So now moving to economic recovery. Space continues to be a concern as businesses struggle to open in a way that allows for these new measures. A local solution in Hamilton is outdoor dining districts, um, which was a motion that was passed in May, which allows for restaurants to utilize the street and park space, parking spaces uh, for patios. And this has been widely adopted elsewhere. Going a step further is the new open air market in Waterloo region, which is located on Willis Way. Um, retrofitting existing underutilized space and converting it to public use could also be a recovery strategy. This could include community gardens, parks, and just spaces to sit and read a book. 
quality public space is necessary social infrastructure for a thriving city, making it a quintessential economic development strategy in this regard. So finally, the permanent aspect of many of these initiatives is obviously coming into question as summer comes down. There have been many new and exciting initiatives coming forward, including the widening of sidewalks for pedestrians, 15 minute cities as we have seen, which would ideally be made permanent. The pandemic has provided opportunities to temporarily try new public space policies, such as the cycling lanes additions throughout the region. Next slide, please. So much of the focus and decision-making during the pandemic was on flattening the curve and curbing the rates of COVID-19. Yet there are many aspects of community health and well-being that were impacted by the closure of public spaces in response to the threat. This is a quintessential wicked problem that I have no doubt future students will be studying. Our review highlights that public spaces, especially parks, streets, sidewalks, civic buildings, and downtown districts were especially hit hard by the physical distancing during the pandemic. These are important spaces for social interaction, mental well-being, and physical activity as well as economic vitality in Waterloo and elsewhere. In communities such as ours, ensuring that current and future population density and intensification are well balanced with accessible and adequate public spaces will be fundamental. It's promising to see temporary road allocations to support physical distancing for the increase of active transport users, as well as the closure of roads for outdoor dining and the reopening of parks and playgrounds. An immediate task though for Canadian communities will be to determine how to sustain these practices into the winter. From an equity perspective, the importance of public space to health and well-being of vulnerable communities has been especially salient during the pandemic. As other presenters have noted earlier today, density limits the availability of private yard space for residents to use while social, social distancing, making green space in parks much more important. For those community members who are living alone, social isolation has posed significant health challenges without access to vibrant community spaces to encounter others. These issues will remain in future waves of COVID-19 and in future pandemics. Safe strategies for physical distancing in public spaces is a top priority to mitigate some of the social challenges experienced by vulnerable populations during COVID-19 and beyond. In closing, public space has long been an important aspect of community health and well-being, and certainly has remained prominent during the pandemic. While the state of emergency used to enforce public health measures was necessary to slow the spread, such measures have both produced and highlighted other negative impacts on community well-being. The challenge during the recovery phase and during future pandemics will be to use public space to balance these impacts equitably. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, we'll now move on to the next presentation in this theme area, and that's going to deal with uh, food systems, something that's definitely been uh, uh, impacted significantly. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to that group. Thank you so much, Clarence. So hi, everybody. My name is Marta Wienhoff, and I'm a PhD student in the School of Planning and the Faculty of Environment. Dr. Leah Miniker, who is an assistant professor in the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo, is also an author on this paper. Uh, so I will be presenting an overview of our paper on fostering resilient food systems in the region of Waterloo. So in the next slide, I'll start by providing the context for the paper and define exactly what food systems are. I'll go into discussing health, environment, and economy impacts of food systems and how large-scale food supply disruptions, such as COVID-19, impact global and local food supply chains. Lastly, I'll present a set of recommendations for the region that could help support the infrastructure for fostering a local, resilient, and sustainable food system. In the next slide, so global food systems have significant impacts on community health, the economy, and the environment, and are vulnerable to crises such as the recent COVID-19 pandemic. This has sparked communities to think about how they can create sustainable and resilient food systems locally to help withstand any future food supply disruptions. In 2004, the Region of Waterloo Public Health Department initiated the Farms That Sell Local Viability Plan to help identify supports and barriers for farmers selling foods within the region of Waterloo in order to increase local food production, processing, and consumption. Additionally, the region set forth the 2013 Food Systems Charter, which also aims to promote a healthy, just, and sustainable food system. 
As such, the region of Waterloo has been a national leader in demonstrating their commitment to supporting resilient and sustainable local food systems. So in the next slide, food systems are a series of processes that form the foundation of the food cycle. So they include everything from food production to processing to distribution, consumption and waste. A sustainable and resilient food system is one that can provide affordable, accessible and sufficient food to everyone, despite any sudden disruptions and while focusing on strategic food systems, planning policies at multiple geographical scales. As such, the foundation of a resilient food system is enough arable land on which to produce food for the community. So in this paper, we looked at food systems on global, national and local scales in regard to what is currently being done to ensure that there is enough food to feed the projected population of 9.8 billion people in 2050 and looking at the paralleled growth in the region of Waterloo and what is being done here alongside planning policy goals and initiatives. With the majority of people expected to be living in urban areas, there are a number of implications for food security as it relates to urbanization. So in the next slide, I'll outline three major areas of food system influence. So in terms of food and, food and human health, poor quality diets are a leading global cause of death. For mental and social health, poor diets are also associated with low self-esteem, depression, and behavioral problems. Some of the most demanding and hazardous jobs exist in food systems, and collectively these effects make the urbanization food systems health links important for both research and policy interventions. In terms of the environment, food system agricultural activities contribute about 19 to 29% of the total global greenhouse gas emissions and have become a huge priority for global climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. Every year, the world generates approximately 1.3 billion tons of food waste, which is equivalent to 2.6 trillion US dollars. With a growing global population, these numbers are expected to rise unless there are drastic changes that address food waste and food systems. In terms of the economy, investing in local food systems creates increased self-reliance with less dependence on external food outputs to support local food security. So from 2010 to 2015, revenue from farms in the region of Waterloo grew by 19%, totaling $563.6 million in 2015, even though the cropland inventory in the region decreased by over 6,000 acres. So this helps to show there's a huge economic opportunity for growth if we preserve agricultural land in the region. So in the next slide, so we move on to large scale food supply disruptions like COVID-19, which has highlighted some of the vulnerabilities of non-resilient food systems, such as health and economic inequalities for essential food workers. To use a local example of a vulnerable area was the temporary shutdown at Conestoga meat packers in the region due to a COVID-19 outbreak. So due to the nature of working conditions, among other things, and processing plants such as this one, there are various health and economic effects for people in the region. There are many approaches to developing and growing sustainable and resilient food systems globally and locally, such as the United Nations New Urban Agenda, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the Milan Urban Food Policy Agenda as well. So the common food systems goals under these approaches frame cities as solutions rather than problems for modern world challenges that integrate nutritional and food security planning into urbanization strategies. So in the next slide, with food systems being so complex, there is no single solution, but rather choices, programs, and commitments tailored to local food system development that will help foster sustainable and resilient local food systems. As such, we are presenting the following five recommendations for the region of Waterloo. Our first recommendation is to continue focusing residential growth in urban areas. Urban expansion poses challenges for land use planning and protection of existing farmland. In the region of Waterloo official plan, protecting agricultural lands from urban development through a protected countryside designation is a policy that prevents urbanization on specific environmental features throughout the region. So focusing residential growth in urban areas 
of the region of Waterloo rather than greenfield developments will have to preserve land needed for agriculture for local food production. Our second recommendation is supporting peri-urban agricultural practices alongside nutritional literacy. So with the majority of the region's population expected to be live in, living in urban areas by 2050, supporting urban agriculture through community gardens and vertical agriculture may be an important part of a local urban agricultural management strategy. Utilizing existing space for small scale agriculture will also help to decrease food miles, carbon footprints, and could also free up some large scale agricultural lands for future urbanization. One organization that the region of Waterloo may join alongside other municipalities in Ontario is the Ontario Food Collaborative, which aims to improve food literacy through policies and programs that support healthy food consumption. Our third recommendation is to apply the Human Appropriation of Land for Food Index, otherwise known as the HALF Index, for regional agricultural land use modifications. So, the half index is a way of measuring agricultural land that is required to feed the world population. It's expressed as global impacts of dietary patterns as a percentage of land needed. So what the region could consider doing is calculating a number of different population diet scenarios under the half index to inform land use planning policies, ranging from current dietary patterns to dietary patterns that are less land intensive, but still nutritionally adequate. For example, in 2016, the majority or about 69% of farms in the region of Waterloo were livestock farms, which is about 25% more than the provincial average. Since livestock farming is land and resource intensive, if the region of Waterloo applied the half index to calculate current land use versus shifting a percentage of the land away from livestock, we could compare the difference in how much agricultural land we would really need to sustain human nutrition in the region by 2050 under various dietary pattern outcomes. So in the last slide here, our fourth recommendation is to create effective food waste reduction programs and policies. So improving local public food policies will encourage health promotion, environmental sustainability, and economic resiliency. For example, adopting a policy and strategy to calculate food loss and food waste in the region will be important to quantify, understand, and also save excessive amounts of wasted edible food. Some other steps in the region of Waterloo uh, that the region of Waterloo could take towards food waste resiliency includes building better infrastructure for cold storage solutions for food preservation, banning commercial food waste through policy formation and food recycling program implementations, and working with the region of Waterloo Food Bank to help distribute the edible food diverted from the landfill. So our fifth and final recommendation is to support local culture and economy through technological and digital innovation. The region of Waterloo has a high presence in employment in agriculture and technology. So with tech hubs such as Communitech, there's an opportunity to better utilize local startup culture for local agricultural advancements. Connecting local agriculture with food entrepreneurs is a really important step to solving modern food systems issues while growing the local economy. Supporting a resilient food system means continuously investing and in innovating the food space across all levels, including distribution, production, and in food itself through things like global agricultural innovations like online vegetable box subscriptions, vertical farming, and experimenting with lab grown meat. With agricultural advancements like this on the rise across the world, there's a real opportunity to connect the region of Waterloo and the tech space here with the region's agricultural sector to enhance local economic activity. This concludes this presentation on resilient food systems in the region of Waterloo, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. Um, our next presentation in the sequence uh, is gonna delve into air quality in the region. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thanks, Clarence. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here today. My name is Jeremy Pittman, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo School of Planning. Um, I'm going to speak to you a little bit today about the environmental side of COVID-19 impacts in urban areas, um, as Clarence noted, with a focus on urban air quality, mostly because that's where most of the studies have been done so far. Um, next, slide, next slide, please. Uh, so, 
yeah, um, basically the approach I took was a rapid systematic review, uh, which means that I was looking to synthesize across all the existing studies that are out there um, and try to draw some insights from them um, and doing it quickly. That's kind of the rapid part, I guess, um, uh, in order to, to inform this presentation. Um, I started off with a really broad question that was around sort of, you know, various um, environmental impacts from COVID. So, um, you know, you all probably noticed uh, right when the pandemic was, 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 was kicking up or just beginning, uh, there's a lot of news reports about, you know, animals coming back to the city, um, you know, the, the waterways in Venice running clear and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, what I was hoping to do with this presentation is to look at the peer reviewed literature and see which of those um, uh, potential uh, I guess consequences or beneficial consequences of the um, of, of the pandemic, which of those are we actually seeing um, in the peer reviewed literature. So I did an initial literature search um, and what I found was um, most of the studies so far had actually focused on urban air quality in the peer reviewed literature. So that's where I sort of refined my research question, focus a little bit more on that. Um, you know, in terms of the wildlife and things like that, those types of studies take a little bit longer to do. Um, uh, so that's maybe why they're not showing up uh, right now uh, in the in the peer reviewed literature, whereas you know air quality studies can be done with existing satellite data or, or through existing monitoring networks. So um, that might be a little bit of a reason why um, I was only finding air quality studies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that just gives you a sense of the, of the, oh, if you could mind going back quick, sorry about that. Um, uh, that just gives you a sense of the keywords that I used uh, to look for different papers in, in, the, in the different databases I mentioned before, but I, I did include keywords originally around wildlife and biodiversity, um, but they didn't have any hits. Um, I used uh, um, a research database called Scopus. Um, originally, I had 98 papers that came out, but after screening, there's only about 51 papers that are relevant. So the rest of the, of the presentation that I'll be speaking to you about is about those 51 papers. Uh, next slide, please. So this map just gives you a sense of um, where the different studies have been coming from so far. Um, so you notice, you know, 16 in China, 11 in India, those are the places where there's been sort of the, the most um, uh, research attention to date on the, the, the uh, impacts of COVID on urban air quality. Um, in some cases in China in particular, um, there's actually even been multiple studies on the same city already. So that's, that's kind, of, kind of interesting. It's getting a lot of focus in those areas or in, in, those, in those two countries. Um, you know, this, you know the, the, the numbers of studies aren't quite as high in, 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 in the other countries. Uh, Brazil has four, the US has about three, um, you know, and then there's a handful just from Italy, Spain, Morocco, uh, and Malaysia, and as, and as, as well as one in, in Kazakhstan. So, um, you know, the bulk of the studies to date have been from China and India. Um, there's a few more from Brazil and the US, um, and then just a handful from, from other countries throughout the world. Um, one thing that's um, uh, really important to note, however, is that so far as, as far as I could find, there hasn't been a study published on Canada yet. Um, so that's kind of a, a, you know, a, a research gap that remains um, and probably should be some uh, of, of focus um, for, for future research. Next slide, please. So, what is sort of coming up um, in the, uh, so remember my animations are kind of going all at once, but um, what's, what's, uh, what's coming up is sort of the dominant narrative across these papers. Um, so you have the lockdown that, that occurred. Um, yeah, that's where, you know, we have these uh, restrictions on travel, uh, requirements to social distance and that type of thing. Um, what we're seeing across a lot of the studies, across a lot of the cities, is that actually reduced um, PM 2.5. That's what we call a fine particulate matter. So, you know, piece of dust and stuff like that. Um, in the air, um, as well as uh, nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides, which are um, largely associated with the burning of fossil fuels or, or driving your car, essentially. So, um, you know, and this makes a lot of sense. Due to the lockdown, we are seeing a re reduction um, in these different pollutants. Um, and this range is, 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 is kind of coarse. Um, and I'm going to, you know, continue to refine a little bit as I dig it deeper into the studies. But, you know, anywhere from about 25% to 60% decrease um, in these different pollutants um, across the different cities uh, that have been studied so far. Um, one kind of interesting unintended consequence, though, um, that people are still trying to figure out exactly why it happened. There's, there's a couple hypotheses. But um, essentially, this reduction in, um, you know, fine particulate matter nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides potentially led to an increase uh, in uh, ground level ozone or ozone that's kind of near the surface. Um, and in some cases, that's a fairly significant increase, almost up to 116%. Um, that's problematic for, for, you know, a number of reasons. Ozone, you know, you think about the ozone at the top of the atmosphere, it's, it's beneficial, right? It's something that, that we want there. 
Um, but when it's kind of at surface level, it can cause, you know, breathing problems and stuff like that. Um, and can be, you know, quite problematic for people that, that um, have existing conditions um, uh, in terms of their respiratory system. So, you know, that's, it's an interesting, you know, and potentially problematic interaction effect there. As we're dealing with a virus that impacts our respiratory system, there's also potentially more ozone uh, in some of these areas, which also has a negative impact on our respiratory system. So, um, you know, some potential, uh, uh, you know, negative unintended consequences there. Um, one of the mechanisms that's been proposed as to why that increase in ozone is occurring is basically because um, ozone reacts which, with nitrogen oxides uh, in, the, in the local atmosphere. Um, in, in cities, so, and, and it reacts in a way that it removes the ozone. So as we're driving less um, and producing less nitrogen oxide, we're actually, you know, not, um, there's less nitrogen oxide available for those reactions to take place, and thus we've had increased ozone um, in, in different places. So that's, that's kind of one, uh, you know, problematic feature to, to think about a little bit more. Um, how do we kind of manage these secondary pollutants? The other thing that's not very well captured in a lot of the studies is the influence on weather. And you'll notice it there. Um, some studies have taken it into account, but um, you know, a few, a few studies haven't really addressed well whether or not the reductions we're seeing are actually due to weather or whether or not they're due to lockdowns. So that's kind of another thing to think about. Um, and finally, one final point for this slide is that um, the same thing doesn't seem to be happening everywhere. So there's, there's some conflicting evidence from the US actually conflicting papers, New York City in particular, where um, you know, one, some papers suggest that there was a reduction, but others say that there wasn't. So that's kind of needs to be dig in, dug into a little bit further. Next slide, please. Um, so just to go through these, these kind of final thoughts quickly, I, I think I'm, I'm approaching my time, um, but you know, just to kind of reiterate it, um, there's some evidence that air quality improved. Um, but these changes might not be observed everywhere. And, you know, in particular, there's no Canadian studies currently. So that's something to kind of think about a little bit. Um, that idea of secondary pollutants like ozone increase in many cases. Um, so that's maybe, the, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a negative consequence of some of these things that needs to be thought through a little bit more. How can we actually manage these, these systems uh, more holistically to, to address, um, you know, sort of multiple pollutants um, at the same time? Um, and the final thought there, um, which is from, one of the one of the one of the probably one of the the, the better studies that's out there uh, by he al 2020 um, was just the idea that um, you know that study focused on China and essentially what they were finding is that the uh, the air quality improvements that were associated with the lockdown um, China was able to achieve similar improvements um, just from you know the, the different uh, policies and regulations they implemented for the Beijing Olympics. Um, and, you know, different fuel regulations and things like that, that they've already implemented. So it just kind of a, a note, I guess, that even though the, the lockdown seems pretty drastic, and it's this huge change in human activity that we expect it to, to have like really great, um, or, you know, really huge uh, impacts on the environment in, in a positive way. Um, essentially, it's, it's a bit of a bright note in that through effective regulation and other policies, we can actually achieve similar types of, of, of reductions um, in pollutants in this case. Um, so it's maybe, you know, one thing to think through a little bit as, as we develop the policy to address these issues as well. Um, thanks, and, and I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, we're now into the Q&A section for this particular group. Um, and I've got a, a question uh, for Lindsay and her team when it comes to, um, I guess, the, the public space, public realm that you examined. Oh, this is a pretty technical question related to uh, widths of sidewalks um, and how that relates to trying to maintain uh, a proper recommended distance. Um, you know, did any of your work look at whether or not people were exploring changing things like the uh, sort of the mandated guidelines for sidewalk width, which I think is currently less than two meters? Um, so currently, a lot of the research being done is just showing that there's just simply not enough room. There's no real solutions as to how to mitigate this moving forward other than the expansion of the sidewalks onto streets, um, reducing the parking on streets and utilizing that as like what Montreal is doing as health corridors and super blocks. So reducing the speed limit, reducing the number of lanes on roads and adding that extra space for, you know, a lane for walkers and running and then a lane for cyclists as well along with the sidewalk so that can also accommodate those long lines at local stores and all that kind of jazz um, i don't know if jennifer or troy have an additional uh, additional comments to this at all um i have some additional thoughts i think one of the 
um, light spots early in the pandemic was the gentleman walking down the city of Toronto with the hula hoop wrapped around him to demonstrate the two meter distance that would be required um, and how impossible it was with light posts and newspaper boxes on the sidewalks. And so I think that COVID-19 has brought to light an issue that accessibility advocates have been talking about for a really long time. So the sideway, the width of the sideways are inadequate for two individuals in a wheelchair or with other assisted mobility devices to get through. But because now it's impacting a larger population, it's now garnered some additional attention. So in the paper, one of the pieces that we look at is drawing on some of the accessibility, um, sort of accessibility rights uh, components and, and bringing that into public space. Right, thank you. Um, and another question related to public realm, and uh, we touched on it um, in a previous uh, section as well, looking at active transportation, for example, is um, programming for winter, right? So, um, you know, in your group's exploration, what are your thoughts around um, how the region can sort of work that in as well? I'm happy to start. So there are other uh, communities and cities in the world that have winter and that do this very successfully. Some of the gold standards in active transportation have winter and they're able to do this. So the region has made, you know, certainly taken some steps in terms of plowing and um, taking care of their cycling lanes that they've just put in uh, for the five-year pilot. In particular, I'm thinking along the university corridor by um, our home base. And so, I mean, there, we know those best practices. Um, we know how to do a lot of that work. Uh, certainly ice is another issue that we face um, and balancing those needs with some of the environmental impacts um, is certainly a uh, consideration. It's one of those, you know, as Lindsay articulated, one of those wicked problems. We have a great solution for active transportation, but in the environmental realm, we're causing additional problems. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, certainly we make recommendations from the public space human well-being um, and dabbling on planetary health as well. But uh, like most of these decisions, there's a lot of stakeholders that are going to need to be at the table to, to balance that off with some of the environmental uh, preservation aspects that they're looking at. All right, thank you. Um, just a, a question around related to food <clears throat> and Marta's presentation. Um, you touched on some of the examples of uh, some of the changes that um, COVID was I guess, uh, seen realized in the food production system. Um, and you talked about online delivery of, of food boxes. Could you uh, expand on that a little bit further? I mean, I know it's something that um, I've heard a lot of people talking about, but I'm just curious how it fits in um, sort of short-term, long-term um, as a strategy uh, for uh, our, our food system. Absolutely. Thanks, Clarence. Yeah, for the online subscription boxes and even, you know, through places like Amazon, we've noticed upticks in people purchasing things online because either they don't want to go to stores uh, because they want to limit their exposure to COVID-19 um, or they want to limit their exposure that they bring home to their families, etc. And one of the things that people um, had created pre-COVID-19 are food subscription boxes, but I think now is where we really started to see that take off a little bit. So people are becoming more comfortable with getting that delivered to their doors and are more happy to pay um, the fees for that. But currently the infrastructure, um, even we saw with Amazon deliveries and deliveries for stores all around, that really got extended. So before, you know, if Amazon had two day prime delivery, that got extended to a longer period of time. And something like that doesn't really work for food, especially when you're ordering fresh boxes of food. Um, and so that's gonna be a really big challenge for regions and globally as well, for people to solve those issues in order to get that food delivered to consumers in a timely fashion in order to have those nutritious have that food stay nutritious and not be rotten by the time that it reaches the consumer. I mean, do you think that there's enough pressure, not pressure, but enough demand 
mounting now that uh, you could actually shift production to be, you know, more localized rather than, you know, again, I've got a, a friend that's got 500 acres. Well, you know, that's a big operation in the Southern Ontario context for, for market gardening. Um, but what about trying to like uh, within the region, for example, uh, transition to, to smaller sort of farm operations? Absolutely. I think people are starting to see more of the benefit of that. And even with, you know, locally, we have the farmer's market um, and uh, the Kitchener market downtown as well. I think people are looking more to those resources and those local availabilities of food, um, especially when, you know, we see things that aren't on the shelves, the things that have had to travel long distances or cross borders, they're not in stock. And so we're really having to rely on whether we know it or not as well uh, during a time like this, that the things on our shelves are, um, have been more local than, than not. And so I think maybe whether if people know it or not, um, they are doing that, but I think they are starting to become more uh, open to purchasing local because they're understanding the impacts that it has um, on you know, economy, environment, um, and everything else that's been kind of highlighted with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, the question, uh, I think you can see it as well, related to um, the construction and um, activity related to roads and whether or not, you know, again, the lockdown created huge changes in terms of uh, transportation activity. And hence you see that, um, I guess, uh, little sort of mini boom of research related to air quality issues related I think to, to traffic as well and, and heavy industry, et cetera. Uh, did you come across any work that dealt with this whole sort of construction aspect of, uh, of road system as well? Not yet, um, but I imagine those studies are, are, are probably underway. Uh, it would make sense, but um, none looked specifically at, at construction. Um, there were a few from Brazil that looked at um, industrialized areas a little bit more so, um, but uh, for the most part, you know, a lot of the studies so far are mostly looking at, you know, changes in um, just regular everyday driving your car to work kind of thing. Um, but I imagine, you know, what, what the implications are for a construction industry and that type of thing are, are, are probably coming down the pike. Yeah, and, and while I've got you, I mean, I'd be just curious at the literature that you looked at, um, yeah. Did those papers, I mean, did they touch on to, you know, sort of the pre-COVID emphasis, you know, in the climate crisis? And, you know, if we think of where we were at, like, you know, eight, nine months ago, yeah. you know, that conversation has kind of got parked a little bit. But I mean, yet the first thing that people are looking at from an environmental standpoint is this air quality related to, you know, traffic activity. So I'm just curious how that uh, manifests itself in the literature that yeah. you looked at. Yeah, and, and there's a question on the on the chat too, just about like what it means for CO2 levels and you know tying to climate change and that type of thing. Um, so what the studies have shown so far is like in localized localized within cities that there are sort of reductions in CO2 that they're that they're that they're observing. Um, but you know what that means for the global level and the long term. A lot a lot of these studies so so far as well. You know they're looking at the short term impacts. Um, will these kind of persist? You know that's been kind of a common theme in a lot of the presentations, will, will these um, changes persist is, is a big question. Um, but uh, more so too, like, you know, all these changes that happened, what's sort of the, the net impact on the global carbon budget? Nobody really knows yet. Um, some of those studies, like I imagine that there's, a, you know, global carbon budget projects and things like that. They'll probably have data out on this like next year. We'll have a better sense of what this actually means long-term for climate change. Um, but at least in the short term and, you know, at least localized in cities, there were sort of reductions in CO2 that related to, you know, reductions in private transportation and air flights and that type of thing. Um, but, you know, does that have a lasting impact on the climate crisis? You know, jury's still out on whether or not uh, it'll actually influence that at all. So or make it worse even, right? You never really know. <laughs> it could. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so just conscious of the time as well, I wanted to thank the uh, the three groups uh, for their efforts in this, this final session. Um, and then I guess I'm now going to turn, um, have, I haven't been paying attention to see if he's actually still here, but I hope that Rod is still here because uh, he was going to get asked to offer concluding remarks and kind of wrap up the day for us. Um, 
on my behalf, I just wanted to thank uh, all, all the presenters today for doing such a fantastic job uh, and for the audience for funneling in those questions. So uh, Rod, without further ado, I'll hand it off to you to, uh, to wrap this up. Uh, thank you very much, Clarence. This has uh, been really quite an afternoon, and um, uh, I'm actually quite a, kind of astonished by the scope of the uh, work that's been uh, presented to us here today. Um, I would, uh, you know, and the other thing that that has really kind of floored me is this, the the geography of uh, the the people who are attending uh, the seminar this afternoon. Um, just, just you know, we had about a hundred people from the Waterloo region, and then we had um, uh, people from, and of course, representing you know the cities of Cambridge, Waterloo, uh, a, a couple of townships, um, uh, but you know the city of Guelph, the city of Ottawa, York Region, Owen Sound, uh, Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority, the GRCA, the city of Toronto, Durham Region, Peel, Halton, Brampton, uh, Hamilton. Uh, Markham, University of Alberta, you know, so I think clearly um, there's, uh, you know, the, the topic has resonated with a lot of people. This is, the, you know, this um, agenda has uh, been focused on a very compelling set of questions. It's an important set of questions, not only for the region of Waterloo, but for um, local governance uh, really across uh, Ontario. And, um, and beyond. Uh, there isn't a community in the world right now that's not going to face these types of questions in the, uh, in the uh, months and uh, years to come um, because of the scale of uh, COVID-19 and its impact um, on, uh, on um, humanity. Uh, so um, I, I'm really, um, you know, I'm taken by the, the uh, the, the, the responsiveness of um, the University of Waterloo community to, uh, to, to dig in on some of these questions. And I think the analysis is, uh, is insightful and, uh, and extremely helpful in uh, bringing our, um, our debate forward. Um, there isn't any doubt in my mind that it'll inform uh, not only the um, the public conversation that we're having uh, in the region of Waterloo about the future, uh, the future of our, our region and the, and the policy framework that we need to guide it, but also, um, you know, the very specific ways that we can actually build a better community. Um, you know, the the all the way, you know, from from uh, uh, um, you know the nature of the economy that we live. That, that supports us uh, to uh, the way that uh, we dispose of waste, to the way that we design our public realm and um, the, the, the nature of our uh, agricultural economy. Um, so, um, you know, I know that from, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of our organization, it's been extremely helpful. I'm really excited about um, uh, receiving the papers and uh, taking a look at uh, the way these arguments come together, uh, the way this analysis comes together in the papers themselves. Um, I think it's an important body of, uh, of work. I had, a, I had an email this morning from um, our, uh, our new uh, uh, Chief Administrative Officer, Bruce Lochner, who uh, said, listen, uh, I need to see a, I'd like to get a copy of these papers when, uh, when they're available, so please uh, send them over to me. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I know that um, we've got people from various departments on the line uh, absorbing uh, what, what's been presented. So, you know, it's going to, it, this is impactful work. Uh, these are important questions, and I really appreciate the effort that's been, uh, been put into them by uh, faculty members and students alike. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for all of that. All right, thanks, Rod. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the one that should uh, officially end the event uh, at 3.58, um, but uh, I guess that, that job does fall to me. So uh, once again, uh, our sincere thanks to everyone for hanging in there today, for contributing uh, as you did on all fronts. 
Um, and again, I really encourage you to follow up um, if you wanted. I know there's some questions that were asked that uh, maybe didn't get a chance to be addressed. Some was also asked, also asked about contacting the researchers. By all means, if you go to the University of Waterloo uh, website, you'll be able to, to find uh, contact information for those researchers and, and encourage you to, to follow up with them. Um, so thanks so much, everyone. Uh, stay tuned to the region's website where uh, updates will be provided on this as well. And um, we will certainly catch you next time. So thanks and stay safe.